names and teams names just unmute yourselves and uh, let me know if you guys are there or not uh mohsin you live uh, meetings live ma'am yeah please start sulekya sulekya gone okay can we start yeah please go on we are live okay uh so i'm just going to call out your names just let me know if you all are there or not uh mohsina uh please unmute yourselves and let me know if you're there mohsina Okay, next. Ah, uh, Sana Javeria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just join in. Okay. Ah, uh, Sampurna Saha. Ah, uh, yes, I'm here. Ah, uh, Gopu Anthony. Ah, uh, Gopu Anthony. Okay, next. Ah, uh, Sri Megana Kanikapati. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Aditi. Yes, I'm here. Nanalini Devi. Nanalini Devi. Akash Pandey. Uh, yes, present. Samskrita. Uh, yes, I'm here. Imad Rahman. I'm here. Shilpa Raman. Yeah, I'm here. Naga Pranit. Yes, I'm here. Gumbadi Saishri. Yeah, I'm here. Romana Riaz. Romana Riaz. Tanishk Sharma. Tanishk Sharma, Uditi Bandaro. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, is Mohsina here? Okay. And then is Gopu Anthony here? Romana Riaz. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, sir, is my voice audible? Hello. Yes. Yes. Your voice is audible. Yes. Okay. Ah, uh, so welcome today to everyone to the second day of Med in May twenty twenty two. Ah, I would like to welcome our ah. Uh, Judges, Dr. Chinmay Sir and Dr. V. Hiranjani, ma'am, thank you so much for being there with us today. Ah, uh, it's a pleasure to have you both on board today, and congratulations to all the participants who made it so far, and all the best for your presentations. 
Uh, just before we enter into the session, a little about our uh, jury members. So Dr. Chinmay Sir uh, has uh, completed his MBBS from KEM Hospital, Mumbai, and did his MS surgery at Government Medical College, Nagpur, and recently finished his MCH Neurosurgery at NIMS, and is currently working as a consultant at the Department of Neurosurgery, NIMS, Bangalore. Dr. V. Niranjani Ma'am uh, is an MBBS DNB in emergency medicine, and she's an emergency and trauma specialist who certified in American Heart Association PLS and ACLS instructor. And she's working as an emergency and trauma consultant at Alexis Hospital Nagpur. Thank you so much, uh, sir and ma'am, for being there with us today. So. Uh, oh, yeah. Before, uh, I would like to like uh, just uh, mention a few points to our presentees today. Uh, you will be given five minutes to present your presentations. And then uh, the judges will be given two minutes to ask the question and answer session, which will be going on. So it's a total of seven minutes. I request all the presentees to keep your cameras on and uh, make sure you have a good connection and your voice is loud and clear. I will start the timer. When I say start, you guys can start. And as you're closing uh, near to five minutes, just before 30 seconds, I will be giving you a small intimation on a message that you have 30 seconds left so that you can wind up your presentations. Anything beyond it uh, will be have to uh, cut off. So please make sure you finish it in uh, five minutes. I hope everything's clear, right? Any presentees have any other doubts? Okay. So, uh, the, how do we share uh, our screens when we are supposed to present? Uh, I'll call out your name. We have enabled it uh, to all you people. You can present your screen, screens. That's not a problem. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start today's session. Uh, so our first uh, presentee is um, Samskrita. Uh, good morning. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Uh, let me know when you're ready. I'll start the timer. Yeah, okay. let me just share my screen. Yeah, sure. Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible, yeah. Uh, so can I start now? Yeah, sure, start. Uh, good morning to everyone present here and respected judges. I'm Samskrita from a uh, final year MBBA student from Government Bellur Medical College. And today I'm presenting a case uh, titled An Unusual Cause of Abdominal Pain. I would, like my, uh, I would like to thank my guide, Dr. Kalpana, for helping me throughout the process. So we'll start with the history of the presenting illness. Uh, so a 12-year-old male child, first born out of a non-consanguineous marriage, he was immunized up to age, came uh, with history of fever and pain in both lower limbs, uh, history of fever for uh, four days, and history of pain in both lower limbs for two days. Fever was, uh, duration was four days, it was high-grade fever, not responding to paracetamol. Pain in the lower limbs were below the knees, it was a diffuse dull aching type of pain. There was associated tiredness and decreased movements. Past history, there was no similar, uh, his, there was no history of similar episodes in the past and there was no other significant history. Examination, on day one, the child was conscious and febrile. Uh, his uh, temperature was 104.2 degree Fahrenheit. Otherwise, the rest of the vitals were normal. In a local examination of the lower limbs, his skin was normal. There was no local tenderness, no joint pain, and there was no rest, uh, and there was restriction of movement. Examination of the systems, uh, uh, they were all normal. So with the above history and the examination findings, we concluded, uh, we came up with a provisional diagnosis of viral fever with myositis. On, on day two, the child developed features of acute intestinal obstruction. So he had bilious non-projectile vomiting, uh, which multiple episodes, it was mixed with food, uh, non-foul smelling, and it was aggravated on taking food. It was postprandial. 
Uh, he had a colicky type of diffuse abdominal pain. It was non-radiating and there was no referred pain. Um, there were no relieving factors. It was aggravated and taking food. And on examination, there was right iliac fossa tenderness. And there was generalized abdominal distension and no passage stool of latus. And he also developed features of circulatory shock. So he was like lethargic, tachypartic, tachypnic. His peripheral pulses were not felt. Uh, his capillary refill time was greater than two seconds. And his BP was 90 by 60 mmHg, which is normally not hypotensive for this age. But since he was in shock, this is considered hypotensive. And his X-ray abdomen findings uh, showed multiple air fluid levels. And in other investigations, uh, CBC, his, he had leukocytosis uh, and his platelets were normal. Uh, his ESR and CRP were elevated and chest X-ray was also normal. And uh, uh, on suspicion of intussusception, he was taken for emergency laparotomy. And on table, uh, there was uh, the uh, congestion resolved spontaneously and uh, so no resection was done. And after 100% O2 uh, warm uh, patch bonding, the condition resolved. Uh, and there was normal peristalsis. There was no lead point as there was no tumor or any significant lymph nodes. And also due to the ileoileal type of uh, presentation and atypical age of presentation, HSP was suspected. So these are perioperative photographs. So the child was started on injection methylprednisolone. Only a, sec a single dose was given. Uh, we were wary to give him uh, uh, steroids. On second post-operative day, he developed uh, seizures. And this was managed with anti-epileptics and other supportive measures. But his electrolyte levels were normal. And so the MRI showed hyperintense lesions in parietal and occipital lobes, which was suggestive of cerebral edema. And his CSF analysis was normal and renal function tests were also normal. And on the next day, the child developed palpable purpura on both feet. So they were uh, non-blanchable and of size 0.5 centimeter and 0 .5, uh, 0 0.5 to 0.5 centimeters over the bilateral ankle joints and forearm. So a biopsy was taken in suspicion of HSP uh, and uh, the biopsy confirmed uh, that there was small vessel vasculitis. So here you can see the low power and this on the high power, you can see the neutrophilic infiltration uh, and the fibrinoid necrosis involving the small vessels. So since we confirm HSP by skin biopsy, uh, we managed to taper the child to oral steroids and he was discharged. And after follow-up, after one month, the child is now normal. Uh, so what I would like to say is uh, HSP is a very common uh, childhood uh, systemic vasculitis. And we all know the pathogenesis. It is characterized by leukocytoclastic vasculitis and IgA deposition in the small vessels. Uh, so the exact pathogenesis remains unknown. Uh, and uh, the skin, uh, we confirm this by doing a skin biopsy, which will demonstrate the vasculitis in the capillaries. So uh, typical rash is a constant feature of the disease. And in addition, you can have uh, intussusception as a GI uh, sign and uh, uh, other symptoms like renal involvement and uh, joint pain, arthralgia, et cetera. So the renal, Involvement may be the long-term uh, complication it may produce to end-stage renal disease. So the significance of my case is that the rash did not appear first. So the interception preceded the typical rash and the other uh, typical findings. So this, this made the diagnosing process a bit harder. So according to Nelson, it says that uh, other uh, symptoms can uh, occur, bef or can occur 20, uh, before the typical purpura 25% of the time. And we would like to say, uh, we would like to conclude by saying that HSP must be considered in the differential diagnosis of intussusception without any late points. So uh, this intussusception was uh, uh, special because the child uh, presented uh, an atyp he was of an atypical age, that is he was 12 years old. And intussusception is most common in less than two months old infants. And also there were no late points like uh, lymph nodes or tumors. And also it was an ileoileal type of intussusception, whereas ileocolic intussusception is uh, common in this age group. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Sanskrita. Uh, I would like to say that you went uh, one minute beyond your time. So it's close to six minutes. Uh, now I would like to start with a question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Chinmay, sir. Yeah, good morning to everyone. 
नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन संस्कृता आई वुड लाइक टू जस्ट आस्क यू हाउ ओल्ड इज वाज द चाइल्ड 12 इयर्स ओल्ड सर ओके एंड पेशेंट इज करेंटली डूइंग फाइन या ही इज करेंटली डूइंग फाइन सर and uh, at the time of discharge i would like to ask you at the time of discharge what yes, the uh, advice uh, you would have given to the patient and patient's relative like mother or father uh, so the long term complication is renal involvement so we asked him to be uh, wary of hematuria blood in the urine or something like that so for at least 6 months and uh, we also asked him to come back if he uh, if he could see the purpura again the rashes in the lower limbs and dependent parts okay cool. well, basically it is a systemic disease and there are chances of recurrence as well as the involvement of other organs yes so sir. patient needs to be in a regular follow up yes yeah. okay so um and dr niranjan ma'am would you like to ask any questions um good morning samskruta जॉइंटी Okay, so this child when this child presented, he didn't have uh, any of the classical signs of the triad, right? No arthritis, uh, no, no joint, he, no problem, and also not a problem. He only okay. had only fever and pain. Sorry, ma'am. Okay. Ah, uh, so what are the differentials that you consider, ah, uh, except for the provisional diagnosis that you have mentioned of viral uh, fever with myositis? What else did you consider in the differentials? uh later on uh, we uh, thought it could be suspected a kind of vasculitis so i think the first differential for hsp is uh, polyarthritis nodosa and uh, hemorrhagic uh, acute edema hae uh, and uh, micro uh, micro angiopathic uh, uh, polyarthritis okay okay thank you samshuda thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank you samshita thank you for this um next let's move on to our second thank presentation um mosina uh mosina are you there yes um okay let me know when you're ready i'll start the time Yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Um, share your my screen. screen. If your camera is on, is my screen visible? I think that is not, kind not of an error. Now, please. Sorry to waste your time. Is my screen visible now? Ah, uh, no, not yet. Um, uh, let us. Ah, uh, could you to... just give me some moment if that's okay? Okay, fine. Ah, uh, let's move to our next presentation before Mosina. Ah, uh, like so that you can set up uh, by the next presentation. Yours so is that okay? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worry. Ah, uh, next we have Sana Javeria. Ah, uh, Sana Javeria, are you there? Okay. Sampurna Saha. uh yes i'm here yeah um you can start uh, presenting let me know when you're ready yes just a minute
Share my screen. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Oh, no, that's not mine. I think someone else's. Oh. Okay. Actually, that is mine. I'll just uh, pause that. Okay. Uh, is my screen shared? Yes, yes, we can see it now. Okay, okay, so um, I'll start then. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, good morning, uh, respected judges and all the participants and the audience. I'm Sampurna Saha, a fourth year uh, medical student from KMC Manipal. Today, I'll be presenting a case of a 53-year-old male patient hailing from Karkala, Udupi, who is an, a farmer by occupation. The patient presented with the chief complaint of right breast lump since seven months. Patient was apparently asymptomatic seven months ago when he developed a painless right breast swelling that progressively increased from one by one centimeter to seven by seven centimeter. On examination, the lump was uh, eight into seven centimeter central in position. It was irregular, it had irregular surface with ill-defined margin. It had variable consistency, both cystic and hard due to areas of necrosis. The underlying skin was stretched and the nipple was retracted. The overlying skin and uh, uh, it was there was fixity to the skin and the underlying tissue, but there was no fixity to the chest wall. Uh, uh, on examination of lymph node, uh, right uh, a central axillary lymph node, there was one palpable which was firm and mobile. From our history and examination, we came to a differential diagnosis of. Right breast carcinoma with clinical staging T4B N1 M0 and right breast sarcoma with clinical staging T2 N1 M0. After this, for uh, uh, probable diagnosis, uh, investigation was done. Sonomammogram showed a right breast lesion with nipple areolar complex involvement. There was no significant lymph node present. On uh, biopsy, uh, it detected invasive ductal carcinoma with uh, mucinous differentiation. As you can see in the image, there is um, a, a mucinous cell present in the duct. After uh, and also uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization was done, which showed ERPR positive and HER2 negative. Metastatic workup like um, a bone scan and CECT was done, which came to be negative. After this, we came to a diagnosis of right breast invasive ductal carcinoma with mucinous differentiation. After uh, then, the multidisciplinary team they discussed and they planned for a new adjuvant chemotherapy, but there was no uh, decrease in the size of the tumor. After this, Modified radical mastectomy was performed with reconstruction with thoracodorsal artery perforator flap. After this, there was congestion of the flap that was seen and leech therapy was done, after which the uh, flap was salvaged. Um, so uh, after this, uh, patient was uh, followed up and uh, his took, uh, pathology showed there was a close margin of 1 mm post-modified radical mastectomy. So then the patient was planned for adjuvant radiotherapy with adjuvant hormone therapy. So from this case, we uh, came to the conclusion that um, mixed mucinous uh, breast carcinoma has a good prognosis, but patients present in an adv advanced stage, so it should be treated aggressively with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sampurna. You finished your presentation in four minutes and nine seconds. Um, judges, would you like to, uh, Dr. Niranjani, ma'am? Uh, hello? Uh, 
um, Dr. Niranshan, ma'am. Hello. Uh, uh, Dr. Chinmay, sir, you can go ahead. Yeah, Sam uh, Sampurna, what was the neoadjuvant therapy received by the patient? Uh, adriamycin with cyclophosphamide and paclitaxel. Four cycles were given, sir. Four cycles were given. Yes. Okay. And after uh, how many days uh, surgery was done? Uh, surgery, um, I, uh, after uh, six weeks of treatment, uh, surgery uh, was performed because there was no change in the size of the tumor. It still remained seven into eight centimeter. Okay. And what is the role of adjuvant therapy now? Uh, actually, as there is a close margin of 1 mm, there is a chance of recurrence that can happen or there might be rem remnants of the tumor uh, cells to be present. So for that, um, adjuvant therapy will help in um, eliminating those cells or preventing recurrence. Okay, and uh, how common is the recurrence in male uh, CA breast? Uh, in, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is low. Um, percentage wise, I'm not so sure, sir, but, um, it is, uh, it is low, but uh, it again depends on, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, how, how much is the close margin? If it is more than two mm, then the recurrence chances is less, but as in this case, it is one mm. So that's why the recurrence chances more. So, uh, that's why, uh, adjuvant therapy is required. Okay, good. And uh, uh, in prognosis wise, male CA breast or uh, prognosis is better or same as uh, female CA breast? Uh, it is same as uh, female uh, uh, breast cancer, sir. Okay. Age wise, the prognosis, age distributed prognosis is same, but the, if we remove the age factor from the prognostication, the prognosis is worse as compared to the female CA breast. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Because they present late. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Okay, good, good. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Niranjini, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Sampana. Good um, morning. I would like to ask what are the risk factors uh, for like is it is it is a rare presentation male breast carcinoma? So what are the risk yes. factors associated with it? Uh, Ma'am, in this case, it was a sporadic case, but normally uh, male breast carcinoma, the risk factors are um, uh, BRCA2 uh, gene, uh, if there is the mutation of BRCA2 gene, or if there is any radiation to the chest that was given previously, or uh, if there is any estrogen uh, therapy that the patient is being taken. So, or obesity, these are the risk factors for um, male breast carcinoma. Okay. Uh, does family history uh, matter in uh, male breast carcinoma also? Yes, ma'am. Uh, BRCA2, if, the, uh, if there is mutation and uh, if, if it is there in like uh, the first, uh, 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 first order relative, then there is a high chance of uh, male uh, carcinoma to occur. Breast carcinoma or ovarian carcinoma or prostate or uh, colon colorectal carcinoma. If it's there, there is a chance of male breast carcinoma to happen. Okay. Any genetic uh, disease you know of which can be associated with male breast carcinoma? Uh, genetic disease. Um, Kleinfelter's. Uh, there is a high predisposition for male breast carcinoma. Uh, so, what was the follow-up of your patient, uh, Sampurna? Um, Ma'am, uh, post-surgery, uh, the patient underwent, uh, I mean, histopathological uh, specimen that was sent that uh, after the report came back, it showed uh, 1 mm close margin. So, uh, seeing that and mm -hmm. ultrasound was done, uh, after that, they came to a conclusion that uh, it, uh, the patient requires adjuvant uh, uh, radiotherapy and hormone uh, therapy to prevent any um, remnant uh, tumor cell that might be present or for preventing recurrence. Okay. 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 Thank you, Sampurna. Thank you. Uh, Sampurna, just for my curiosity, biopsy was done from the uh, lesion itself or uh, lymph node? 
Uh, so um, after uh, ultrasound was done, it showed that the lymph node was um, negative. It wasn't sig significant. So the biopsy was done from the tumors uh, on the breast. Uh, biopsy was done, not the lymph node. <laughs> Okay, okay, fine. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sampona. Uh, next, uh, do we have Musina? Uh, yes. Share your screen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Mohasana Nebat. I am presenting a case of rare sacrococcygeal teratoma today. So, uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma is a rare fetal neoplasm that occurs one in 40,000 births, and mostly female infants are usually affected. So usually they arise from the totipotent somatic cells that originate from the primitive node, which is attached to the coccyx. The tumor is composed of three or two uh, germ cell layers, and they have multiple tissue types. The etiology is unknown, and they are classified into benign, which is mature, and malignant, which is immature. Usually they are asymptomatic, but if they are large in size, they might cause complications like fetal heart failure, high drops fetalis, and other complications like constipation, urinary infection, and partial paralysis. So it can be uh, diagnosed through prenatal ultrasound as uh, an external component, which is fluid fill or a solid mass that is sticking out of the fetus's body. So uh, you, uh, they are usually entirely internal, then they might be undetected if they are small. If they, uh, even if they are detected, there'll be a small uh, fluctuation or abnormality in the fetal bladder, which will lead to the diagnosis prenatally. It is associated with my, uh, myelomyelbocil and vertebral anomalies. The tumor markers are, which are elevated is alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. So there are four types. One, type one is completely external. Type two, when it is both internal and external. Type three, when it is partially, like very little amount is outside and most of the uh, uh, content is inside the child's body, uh, abdomen. And type four, when it's completely inside. So my case is about a three month year old male child who came with swelling in the sacrococcygeal region since birth. So at, at birth, the size was around six into four centimeter, which gradually increased and it became to uh, 20 to 15 centimeter in size. So the local examination, it was a soft mass in the sacrococcygeal region, which was covered with brown indurated skin. The anal opening was displaced anteriorly, but the anal tone was normal. The upper margin of the a uh, mass could not be reached through a rectal examination and the bowel and bladder function was normal. So here in the image, you can see the uh, mass with the anterior displacement of the anus. So the investigation which we did to confirm the diagnosis initially was the USG, which showed mixed echogenic lesion in, with cystic area of calcification in the sacrococcygeal region. And later on, an MRI was done where ma mass with cystic and fat component was seen in the perineal and the gluteal region, which was behind the uh, bladder on the left side, suggesting sacrococcygeal teratoma. The AFP was normal, appropriate for the age. So this was the MRI which was taken. The treatment that was uh, given was surgical removal of that uh, tube, uh, tube, teratoma completely. Intraoperatively, the teratoma was sized around 16 into 12 into 10 centimeter. And uh, uh, it was excised along with the coccyx. The coccydectomy was also done. This was the uh, intraoperative image. And this was the uh, final uh, teratoma that was been removed out. So that the confirmatory diagnosis was done by histopathology. The microscopy suggested 
uh, shows this like structures, which is lined by uh, squamous cell, epi uh, squamous epithelium, uh, respiratory epithelium, glandular epithelium, which uh, eventually suggested of sacrococcygeal teratoma, which is a mature type. This is the histopathology. So as a conclusion, the pro usually the sacrococcygeal teratoma has good prognosis once it's removed surgically after birth. So usually it is removed with the coccyx after birth. And uh, we, uh, we did ask the patient to follow up with USG and alpha fetoprotein yearly to make sure if the, uh, the recurrence is not happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you finished your presentation in four minutes and 52 seconds. Uh, that was perfect. Uh, now to the judges, uh, Dr. Niranjani ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Musina. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, what was the age that the child presented you? Three months. Three months. Okay. So, uh, was this uh, sacrificial teratoma present at birth also? So, sorry, ma'am. You're not audible. Hello. Hello. Ah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, the mass was there when the child was born also, correct? Yes, ma'am. The mass was uh, uh -huh. visible at that time. Uh, the medical college where I study is pretty uh, outskirts. So the people are usually not bothered when there is a congenital anomaly until it's not very progressive. Mm -hmm. The symptoms usually which presents are always at very uh, late stages when it's very huge and yeah, complicated. Generally, uh, it can be removed post birth also. So why uh, there was a gap of three months? That's it was what, uh, a very was low social, yeah, lo a low socioeconomic background, ma'am. Okay. And uh, any antenatal diagnosis? Um, no, ma'am. Uh, there was no proper ANC. ANC okay. scannings were not done. Okay. So, and how were the bladder and the bowel movements of the baby till the uh, mass was removed? As you said that, uh, as you presented that the anus was uh, displaced, right? Yeah, uh, other than the structurally, it was placed anterior. The functioning was completely normal. The bowel and the bladder, even after surgery, it was normal. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Musina. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Doctor. Hello, Musina. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, you uh, mentioned about the hydrops fetalis. Can you tell us about the hydrops fetalis? Uh, hydrops fetalis is a uh, yes, sir. It's a complication when there is a excess amount of uh, fluid accumulation uh, in the fetus, uh, which can occur. Uh, it's a fetal anomaly, so I have like I don't have so much of idea about it. Okay, okay, and so in uh, pre there was no prenatal diagnosis for this child. Uh, no, sir. The ANC follow-up was not done. Okay. And the patient, uh, was, uh, this patient was delivered uh, pre-term or uh, at that term? Normal delivery think, or caesarean? Uh, it was a normal delivery, sir. Normal delivery. Okay. So, the uh, patient did not have like uh, pre or nothing? Nothing, sir. Okay. Okay. And uh, there, uh, uh, do you know about the maternal mirror syndrome in this case? Sorry, sir? Maternal, uh, maternal mirror syndrome. Are you aware maternal of this? Maternal mirror syndrome, no, sir. Okay, the mother presents with the same symptoms as a child with a increased cardiac output. Hydrospitalis will the, have a shunting of the, AV shunting of the vessel, the blood. Okay. So there will be, uh, there will be cardiac, uh, uh, features of cardiac failure in fetus as well as polyhydromia. And the same features will develop in the mother. That is the maternal uh, mirror syndrome. Okay, sir. So, do you know about any fetal surgeries? Can be can it be done in uh, intrauterine uh, during the gestation period for these cases? Uh, yes, sir. If it is uh, very big enough, which will harm the fetus uh, before the delivery, the fetal surgeries are being performed. Uh, but I don't know whether it's being performed in the area where I did my studies. 
Okay. Okay. Even in India, it is very rare to do fetal surgery. So, okay. Just wanted to know whether you know or not. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. Next, we have uh, Sana Javeria. Yes, yes. Yes. Just let me know when you're ready. Yeah. Let Musana stop sharing her screen. <clears throat> So shall I share my screen now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, just a minute. I'm sharing through my phone, so please. Okay, is it visible now? No, not yet. Is it visible? Mm -hmm. No. No? No. Not okay, yet. I'm sorry. Let me try again. Is it visible now? Yeah, we can see now. Yes. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So my name is Sana Javeria and I'm a student of finally MBBS from JIIU's Indian Institute of Medical Science and Research. So my topic is polymyositis, which is a rare condition in human, but it's commonly seen in women. So directly jumping to the chief complaints. Uh, the patient complained of weakness and muscles since five years. She complained that she was unable to uh, wake up in the morning five years ago. Uh, and she's not able to walk or move without support. She's not able to even stand up from sitting position. She's a 22 year old girl. Now history of present illness, the patient was apparently all right. Then she developed a weakness in her proximal muscles, which was gradual in onset and progressive, which was more in lower limb and then upper limb and symmetrical in both the sides. Suddenly at one day, she was not able to wake up from bed and since then she's not able to walk without support. When given support, she can stand and can perform moderate household work. <clears throat> the weakness is not associated with pain and do not subside on taking medications. There is no as such history of cranial dysfunction, uh, cranial nerve dysfunction, bowel bladder involvement, seizures, diplopia, vision loss, dysphagia, memory loss or tremors. So this is a normal vaginal delivery at hospital born out of non-consanguineous marriage and not associated with any birth trauma or milestone delay. There is no as such any history of weakness in the past. And uh, there's a significant family history in this case. The patient has one elder brother and one younger brother. Her younger brother has similar complaint of weakness since one year, which is also gradual and progressive. But at the moment, he can at least walk without support. The patient, uh, the personal history is completely normal, like every individual. The menstrual history, the patient attended uh, menarche at the age of 12 years and she gets a regular period. The patient is completely uh, conscious, cooperative and well-oriented to time, place and person. And general examination is also normal. Uh, in systemic examination, while examining CNS, we found that higher functions are intact. All remote, retrograde, and immediate memories are also intact. Speech is fluent and well articulated. The patient is moderately nourished uh, and uh, with adequate build while examining motor system. Having isotonic, uh, with isotonic uh, tone on both the sides. Uh, we observe that power is decreased in the proximal part and grade 5 is observed in the distal parts. Like in the deltoid, biceps and tricep, grade zero and grade four respectively can be seen in the upper limb and extensor and flexors have grade five on both the sides. And similarly in the lower limb, in the proximal part, we observe grade zero along with in the distal part, we observe grade four on both the sides. So this is a videographic representation. Uh, now, coming to the reflexes, we observe that uh, superficial, superficial reflexes like corneal conjunctival were normal and present. Abdominal and plantar were, were absent. Deep reflexes were almost absent or plus one, like uh, just observed because of the weakness 
in sensory examination we observed that touch temperature pressure tactile localization and stereognosis both were all were present on both the sides but proprioception was was absent and in cerebral functions we found that heel to nose test uh, was absent and finger to nose and finger to finger was present and in gait uh, as i said she is not able to walk and all the systems when examined were normal in investigations we did all the routine investigations along with serum calcium magnesium phosphorus creatine kinase serology mri and ct scan here are the reports and to summarize uh, she is a 22 year old girl who came to the opd with the chief complaints of weakness since 5 years which was symmetrical and gradual and progressive in nature not associated with pain she is unable to walk without support she has more weakness in the proximal part as compared to the distal part and her, her younger brother has similar complaint so my provisional diagnosis would be polymyositis thank you so this was all about my presentation Uh, thank you. Uh, so you've taken uh, four minutes and thirty seconds. Uh, now to the judges, Dr. Chinmay sir. Uh, Chinmay sir. Um, Dr. Niranjani ma'am. uh dr niranjani ma'am uh chinmay sir can you hear us hello sana hello hello sir yeah uh, so you said that there is family history is present in this yes case. sir Yes. So, what are the other risk factors for polymyositis? Not uh, in this in general. Uh, uh, presence of auto antibodies like ANA and anti-myositis, uh, polymyositis antibodies. Okay. So, uh, uh, what other anti-bodies uh, are present in polymyositis? first of all uh, uh, polymyositis antibody itself is present along with ana and other antibodies uh, sorry i don't know i don't read about it oh, okay and uh, any uh, association with uh, viruses do you no, know no sir no no there is no history of any viral fever or viral infection no no in general in general i'm not talking about your case just in polymyositis uh, are they associated it with any viral infection uh yes in in some cases there is association okay which viruses can you just tell us uh uh hpv okay okay fine fine so uh, any uh, have you uh, observed any complication in this your case uh, no sir as uh, i see. mentioned there uh. is just weakness in the proximal part on uh. both the upper limb and lower limb and she is unable to uh, wake up from the stand up from the sitting position and unable to walk this is just the history there were no complications okay okay fine So, how are you planning to follow up this patient in future? Uh, as sir, Any... she as uh, she is having this condition since five years. So she uh, came to a hospital uh, to show if there is any treatment in her hospital. Uh, so we told her that this is a condition is not curable. We can give her corticosteroids to just subside uh, symptom to give symptomatic treatment. Uh, so I we said her to follow up after six months if there is any pro uh, betterment. Okay. On the follow up, what uh, will you check? Uh, power and uh, tone of the muscles, and if the reflexes uh, are like, uh, if reflexes came back, and there is decrease in weakness. Yeah, as you said, this is a systemic disease, and other systems would you like to check? Uh, CNS first of all, hmm. then uh, uh, abdominal, as uh, okay. in some cases there is dysarthria and dysphagia also see. 
then RS, uh, in the, uh, like there could be paralysis of the or weakness of the diaphragmatic muscles. And oh. So in case uh, she's on steroid and she, if she develops uh, any infection. So no, she, uh, no, no, when no, I took in, the case, she was not on any medication. Okay, you started her on steroids. Uh, yes. And after that, if she develops infection, what should you do? Uh, we will uh, stop the steroids gradually and treat the infection first. You have to admit her in the ICU because your immunity yes. is low. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good, good. Okay. I think Niranjani has to go for uh, emergency. Okay, sir. Um, hello? Yeah, yeah. I think Niranjani has to go for some emergency. Okay, okay. No worries, sir. Um, so, shall I stop sharing my screen now? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, Niranjani, ma'am. Uh, so, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just uh, have some emergency in my emergency. Okay. Uh, probably just uh, in this case, I couldn't attend, so I won't question uh, Sana also. Um, so, I'll probably come for the next case. Okay. I'll be back at some time. Okay, okay, sure, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next, we have uh, Gopu Anthony. Are you there? Okay. Um, next, I'll be calling Mrinalini Devi because she has a couple of connectivity issues she was asking. Uh, so she would like to go first. I hope the presentees don't mind. Uh, Mrinalini, are you there? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, you can uh, go ahead. Yeah, is my screen visible? Not yet. Now? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, Let me know when you're ready. Yeah, can I start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, a pleasant good morning to one of the present here. Minani? Uh, hello? Minani? Okay, uh, looks like Minani has a couple of uh, issues with her uh, network. Um, do we have Meghana next? Hello? Yeah, Megan, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess so Nani has issues, so you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Just a minute, I would like to share my screen. Oh, sure. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, your screen, your screen is visible. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start. Yeah, yeah, I'm starting this. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sri Meghna Kankupati, third year MBBA student from Andhra Medical College, Vishakapatna. And my case was Debarshi syndrome and autosomal recessive crossroid syndrome. Complaint A two days old female child was referred to pediatrics department with complaints of laxity of skin, thin body stature claw-like hands, and mild respiratory distress. Patient particulars, baby of Mrs. Pooja, date of birth was 15-6-2022, estimated date of delivery was 17-6-2022, and time of birth was 9.30 a.m., age of uh, two days, and gender was female. Mother's age was 22 years, marital life is one year, informant is mother, and her reliability is good. Antenatal history, first trimester. 
antenatal care visits are totally free. There is no history of fever with rashes, chemoradiation exposure, chronic drug usage, or thyroid disorder. Second trimester, took IFA prophylaxis and two TT doses. No history of anemia or APH. Third trimester, no history of prolonged labor, no history of post delivery, ANC visits are six, growth scan is done, and IUGR is noted. Natal history, term birth and SGA is noted. Postnatal history, delayed cry after birth is seen. Immunization history, BCG, OPV, HBV are given at birth. Family history, third degree consanguineous marriage is noted. History of abortion at three months, one year back was noted. No history of TB, epilepsy, thyroid, or renal diseases. Feeding history. Breastfeeding is initiated within 30 minutes of delivery. No supplementary feeds are given. Number of times fed per day were as per demand. Anthropometry. Birth weight is 1.6 kg. Length of the baby is 44 cm. Head circumference is 30.8 cm. Chest circumference is 29.7 cm. And her ponderal index is 1.88. General examination. Heart rate is 160 per minute, SpO2 is 98%, RR is 60 per minute, temperature is epibrile, CRT is 2 seconds, pulse is normal in volume, rate and rhythm. Head to toe examination. Skull, anterior and posterior fontanella are wide open, ears are low set with slightly larger ear lobes. Eyes, corneal opacities and uh, cataracts are seen in both the eyes, chest and abdomen. Pectus excavatum is noted. Visible veins are seen all over the chest and abdomen. Upper limb. Bilateral clawing of both hands is noted. Lower limbs are apparently normal. Umbilicus is normal. Anal orifice is plated. External genitalia shows she is female with mild clitoral megaly. Systemic examination. CNS. Rooting reflex is positive. Sucking reflex is positive. And Morris reflex is incomplete. CVS. S1 and S2 are heard, no mamas are observed. RS, bilateral NVBS are positive, no, ad, no added sounds are seen. Musculoskeletal examination showed gross hypotonia and flexion contractures of both wrist joints with claw like fingers. Ocular examination showed corneal opacities and cataract formation in both the eyes. Dermatological evaluation revealed thin, atrophic, wrinkled skin with reduced subcutaneous fat. Investigation. Verhoff, Van Gies, and Stain showed markedly reduced elastic tissue fibers in lower dermis and presence of sparse, small, fragmented elastic fibers. Provisional diagnosis based on above investigation and examination, for provisional diagnosis of uh, Debasi syndrome was made. Prognosis Patients with DBS have variable outcomes. Some patients die in childhood due to severe neurological dysfunction and intercurrent infections. Many fa patients diagnosed with PCR1 mutations show a positive, spontaneous improvement of the progeroid features. And in some children, the movement disorder remains non-progressive. Differential diagnosis, Ahlerdanalis syndrome, pseudoxanthum elasticum, Cantor syndrome, Kokiani syndrome, Hutchinson Gilport progeria. Management. It is multidisciplinary, genetic, ophthalmology, neurology, urology, cardiology, gastroenterology, and the orthopedics must be informed about the disease and its life expectancy and prioritize treatments that improve the patient's quality of life. Follow. Proper palliative care is advised and is asked to be brought to the hospital whenever necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you finished your presentation in uh, four minutes and 30 seconds. Um, Dr. Chinmay, sir. Hello. Nice presentation, Magna. And very nice case also. So uh, this DBASI uh, diagnosis you made clinically or any uh, test was, any other test was done? Uh, uh, like actually, genetic testing or uh, anything was done? Yes, sir. We sent for genetic testing and the result came after one month, sir. And it was positive for DBASI syndrome, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, I just know this, this syndrome is very rare. I also don't know much about this syndrome. So yes, you have sir, to tell me... Yes, sir, yes, sir. It was one of the very rarest syndromes and uh, less than 30 cases were reported till now worldwide, sir. Oh, nice. Only 30 cases worldwide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Try to publish and, in an international general journal for this case report. Yes, sir. And it uh, was reportedly to be the second case in India, sir. Second in India? You, yes. Do you have any idea about the first case where it was reported? 
Yes, sir. It was from a rural area in Rajasthan, sir. Okay. Fine. And uh, the longest patient to be alive was found to be only twenty-four years, sir. And it was reported from uh, Ukraine. Okay. So, what is the cause of uh, their mortality in these cases? Mortality is uh, due to dislocations and uh, neurological manifestations like seizures and also, and uh, in some cases like uh, PYC R1 gene mutation, there is also purine synthesis uh, abnormality, sir, which decreases in uh, arginine, ornithine, citrulline, and proline in blood levels and increases ammonia and uh, secondary urine cycle urea cycle disturbances. Sir. So in these cases, we can give a prophylaxis of uh, lonaparinib tablets uh, or IV, sir. But uh, the prognosis is not that much good, sir. Okay, so symptomatic treatment only. Yeah, we can only give symptomatic treatment as there is also laxity and uh, tendon reflexes are very poor and uh, we can also see frequent dislocations and subluxations, sir. So for that, we can give uh, surgeries for cases like hip di dislocations and also. Okay. Any other uh, disease associated with this uh, syndrome? Uh, actually, according to the studies, only we can see like uh, blindness due to corneal opacities and all. So there is no okay. much information about this disease except for uh, laxities and all. Okay. And uh, there is reported to be uh, milestone deformities and all. So. Developmental delay. Yes, sir. Seizures are seen. Uh, which are involuntary, slow, and uh, acetoid movements also can be seen in the feet, arms, and legs. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, Niranjani can ask us if she's available. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I'm available. Um, Shri Meghna, I wanted to, you have covered maximum whatever I wanted to ask in search questions also. Any other uh, genetic mutations, you know, which can be linked to Debashi? Yes, ma'am. Uh, reportedly, there were two genes that lead to mutations, ma'am, like PYCR1 gene and uh, ALDH18A1 gene, ma'am. PYCR1 mm. gene, which is present on uh, chromosome 17 long arm, it leads to 3D type of the disease, and ALDH18A1, which, which is present on long arm of chromosome 10, it can lead to 3A type of the disease, ma'am. Okay, and the biochemical changes of the purine cycle uh, synthesis, uh, sorry, urea cycle disturbances and purine synthesis that you mentioned, uh, uh, it is common in which type of the disease? ALDH18A type 1 gene, ma'am. Okay, uh, that is the 3A type of uh, mutation. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, did you screen this patient for any purine synthesis defect as such? Uh, yes, ma'am, but uh, there were mild disturbances in urea cycle was noted, but uh, we couldn't make the entire uh, diagnosis and uh, we sent it for genetic screening. Okay, that was not, uh, that is not to come back yet, genetic uh, cardiotyping, I need to. Yeah, we need to do still more investigations and uh, according to current available investigations and examinations, it was a part mm -hmm. provisional diagnosis with DBS, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh, so, how is the genetic uh, inheritance pattern in this? It is uh, autosomal recessive type, ma'am. So, uh, how what, what is the risk like genetic counseling for the parents? How will you do prenatal counseling if you want? They are planning for another child. So, oh, how to go about the prenatal yeah, counseling? Actually, yes, ma'am. Uh, we asked the parents about their history, and uh, there was no apparent cases like this in their community or in their family from the past. So we informed them mm -hmm. about this case and uh, the rarity of this case. And we also told them about their uh, next uh, progeny may also lead to also maybe like this, but uh, the mm -hmm. chances are very low and uh, there's nothing we could do exactly about this and uh, only palliative treatment is the choice. So we told them about all these information. Okay, so disease risk in next progeny? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, it is a uh, very rare. Mm -hmm. So, I think from if, if, uh, other studies available, the other progeny mm -hmm. may be absolutely normal. Okay. And the carrier risk of the uh, baby? Carrier risk is also uh, very minute, ma'am. It may be, according to us, it is a uh, 
it is an autosomal recessive uh, disease right according to the genetic recessive pattern uh, yes ma'am but uh, that autosomal recessive pattern was not completely proved ma'am it was based on the previous yeah. uh, no not in this case but in per se for the dbas syndrome uh, per se for dbas syndrome uh, yeah. the carrier risk is very less ma'am actually so we couldn't say that uh, other progeny also in this uh, family cycle may le- may develop this disease like that we can't say in proper manner ma'am oh. Uh, actually, in any autosomal uh, diseases, the risk of the uh, progeny getting the disease is around twenty five percent, and carrier yes, risk is around fifty percent. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But uh, like this, it was also a case yes, study in Pakistan yes. was done, ma'am. A case study of mm-hmm. Pakistan was done, but uh, in that case study, the autosomal recessive pattern wasn't proved to happen, ma'am. Oh, okay. so. Okay. There is still a debate on this autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance okay. going on. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Manan. Yes. Okay. Can I stop sharing my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Ah, uh, next. Ah, uh, do we have Aditi? Yes. Yes, Aditi. Ah, uh, you can share and let me know when you're ready. Okay. I uh, request the participants to please switch on their cameras during uh, the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aditi. I am a BDS final year student here at S J T University, Gurugram. I am presenting this case under the guidance of Dr. Minerva Singh, who is a senior lecturer, Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, Faculty of Dental Sciences. This case is of foramen of Hushke, a portal between ear and temporomandibular joint. It's a very rare disorder. A 42-year-old male, Mohammad Khaled, a carpenter by occupation, resident of Gurgaon, presented with a chief complaint of pain in his upper, in the front of left ear on mouth opening since one month. The history of present illness: the patient first noted intermittent fluid discharge with respect to left ear in his childhood. No treatment was sought for it. now the patient presents with pain in left preauricular region on mouth opening pain and fluid discharge from ipsilateral ear since one month he reported to the department of ent where a diagnosis of otitis media was given for the for the same the patient was referred to the department of oral and maxillofacial surgery no relevant past medical history past dental history or family history was reported the personal history the patient consumes a non vegetarian diet brushes once daily using a fluorinated toothpaste no history of smoking alcohol and tobacco patient reported that he has a normal sleep cycle on general physical examination the patient is conscious cooperative well developed well nourished oriented to time place person and situation the gait is normal the vitals were within the normal limits on physical on local extraoral examination a mild diffuse tender swelling approximately 2 by 2 cm in time where the signs of inflammation was noted with respect to the left preauricular region tenderness was present with respect to left temporomandibular Joint on mouth opening. No joint sounds or mandibular deviation was noted. No active ear discharge was present. No abnormality detected with respect to hard and soft tissues on intraoral examination. A provisional diagnosis of otitis media of the left ear leading to chronic osteomyelitis of the left TMJ. The differential diagnoses were synovitis of the left TMJ, arthritis, or parotid sciatitis. On investigations, a CBCT was performed with respect to the left TMJ. As seen in the first picture, a circle is made, and on the uh, second picture, you can see the diameter on the sagittal plane was 2.35 millimeter with respect to the anterior inferior surface of the le- uh, left external acoustic canal. In the axial section, in the first picture, the circle is made, and the dimensions were of 1.48 millimeter. On the 3D uh, reconstruction, a patency on the anterior surface of the external acoustic canal, which is referred to as a foramen of Hushke literature, was seen. Osteolytic changes on the posterior surface of the lateral pole of the left condyle was seen. In the coronal section, the thinning of the cortical bone has been seen around the condyle. The trabecular trabeculae are widely spread, which depicts a decreased bone density, which are the signs of osteolytic changes. A final diagnosis of chronic otitis media with respect to the left ear, leading to superficial osteomyelitis of the left temporomandibular joint through the patent or uh, uh, patent foramen of Hushke. A treatment, medicinal treatment of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid, metronidazole, acyclovir, and paracetamol was given. 
For surgical interventions, after the acute symptoms subside, TMJ exploration, that is endoral, followed by closure of foramen of Hushke using tragal cartilage graft in collaboration with the ENT team. The prognosis is expected to be good. Follow up. The patient has to be followed up fortnightly in the first post operative month and then monthly for the next six months. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you presented in three minutes and 35 seconds. Uh, to the judges, uh, Dr. Niran Shriva. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what is the normal uh, closure time of Ramana Kashki? Ma'am, can you please repeat? What is the normal closure time of Ramana Kashki? Is it persistent yeah. always or? Uh, the usual timing for closure is about five years. If it persists after five years, we need to uh, do some medicinal or surgical approaches. Okay. Uh, so how will you uh, examine the temporomandibular joint? The temporomandibular joint, first the bimanual palpation would be done to see for the uh, tenderness or any sort of deletion if it's feel. But the patient at that time, there was no active discharge. If the active discharge was there, uh, we could do arthroscopy other than the, and the other uh, TMJ approaches uh, can be pre-auricular, post-auricular, or uh, we can also do uh, transcanal, but transcanal has a disadvantage or drawback, as we can say, because for that, we need to cut through the canal and it can uh, damage the cartilages, which can lead to uh, infection in future and uh, stenosis of the canal. Okay, and uh, what are the other uh, dispensers that you can consider in this case? In this, we could consider arthritis, but it was uh, not there because in arthritis, joint pain is seen in other joints, but the patient had no other complaint of joint pain. Others can be uh, synovitis, but in synovitis, he only had discharge from uh, one side only, and usually uh, there are other symptoms also. Uh, another one can be parotid cell adenitis, but in parotid cell adenitis, the patient usually uh, complains of pain in mouth opening when there's a food stimulus. Like when patient has to eat food or when he smells the food, there is usually pain at that time. But the patient reported that he had pain every time he opens his mouth. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you from my side. Uh, Dr. Chinmay, sir. Hello, Aditi. Nice presentation. Uh, uh, what, are the, what is the plan for uh, uploading this, uh, canal, this duct? So we are uh, planning for uh, to do an end, end oral approach. First, we'll uh, made an incision in, in the ear canal, and then we'll uh, open a, a tympano uh, meatal flap, and then uh, we'll be creating an access to the mid, uh, middle ear. And then we'll open the, after opening the canal, we'll just uh, remove the necros tissue. Shaving of the bone would be done, and a tympanic uh, tympanic graft, the tragal graft would be done. Other options can be a, a platinum mesh or a temporal a temporalis muscle graft. Okay, and if suppose this uh, duck, uh, this uh, duck persists, what is the complications you will have later? So the complications would be like still the uh, fluid discharge would be there because the salivary fistula can be created very easily in this area. And the, uh, the condyle that is, has already started to show the osteomyelitic changes, it can persist and then the patient would not be open uh, able to open his mouth uh, in the future. Any uh, are, are you ex during surgery? Are you expecting any injury to other structures, nearby structures? No, sir. Because it's or a, no, sir. Because it's you, a very small right now, and there are no other complications because the parotid is also not in very close approximity, and uh, right now there are no complications that can be expected. Okay. Any antibiotic for this uh, patient has been started on antibiotics? Yes, so he's on antibiotics. He's been given amoxicillin and clavulonic acid, metronidazole and uh, acyclofenac with paracetamol. And uh, after that, mouth opening has uh, increased in the, in the mouth opening has been uh, uh, increased or uh, same as uh, restriction is still there. So uh, restriction, some restriction is still there because the infection was very widely spread in the ear canal also and the TMJ. So the symptoms are subsiding slowly. So after uh, the mouth opening, there is uh, betterment in the mouth opening. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Aditi. Uh, next, uh, do we have Rinaldi? Am I audible? Yes, Rinaldi, you're audible. And um, am I visible? Yes, you are. I'm extremely sorry. Uh, I, I'm having some network problems here. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Is my screen visible? Um, not yet. Yes, we can see now. Um, Is more PPT visible? Yeah, yeah, it is. I think it's upside down. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, um, can I start now? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah, a pleasant good morning to one our present here. I'm extremely sorry for the previous sort of connectivity problem. I'm myself, Dr. Mrinali Devi, here to present a rare case of Mobius syndrome, which we encountered in our hospital. I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Soundarya Ma'am for helping me through this journey. Mobius syndrome is a congenital, non-progressive, complete or partial, unilateral or bilateral patient of palsy with or without paralysis of the other cranial nerves and with physical abnormalities such as multiple malformations, hypoplasia of the brainstem nuclei with the absence or with decreased number of muscle fibers has been reported to be the cause. It was first Paul Julius Mobius, a German neurologist, who described this clinical entity in 1892 uh, with bilateral combined paralysis of 6th and 7th cranial nerves. A 10-year-old female came to a hospital with chief complaints of inability to close her eyelids uh, since birth and inability to close her lips and difficulty in phonation since early childhood. There's a history of tubing of saliva and epicora present. Her antenatal, natal and postnatal periods were uneventful and her immunization has been done as per her age. The parents are young and unrelated at the time of conception. There's no history of any maternal drug intake. There is a history of delayed milestones in all four domains according to the mother, but with eventual attainment of all these milestones by the age of two. There was a history of a feeding problem in early infancy, uh, but uh, it resolved as she grew up. The child is able to do her day-to-day -day activities by herself and performs well in school. Uh, her other two siblings are normal and there's no history of single illness in the family. On examination, we saw that uh, the general examination was normal with the first, third, fourth, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh cranial nerve examinations were normal. There was a simple, incomplete brachysyndactyly of the second, third, and fourth uh, fingers with first web contracture, as seen in this picture of her left hand. Coming to ocular examination, her eyes were orthophoric with six, six by nine partial vision, not improving with pinhole in both eyes. Lag of thalamus with adequate Delch phenomenon and medial canthal tendon laxity was present in both eyes. The conjunctiva was normal with a clear cornea and no signs of exposure keratitis. The anterior chamber was normal in depth and iris normal in color and pattern. Her pupil was reactive to both direct and, light, uh, direct and indirect light effects and her lens was clear. Her fundus was normal uh, bilaterally and her near reflex was present. Color vision and field of vision were normal. The snapback test was negative and fluorescent dye disappearance test was positive. Here we see the clinical picture with the snapback test and the uh, medial cathode tendon laxity and lack of thalamus. Uh, here we see for her left eye duction movements, that is her uh, uniocular movements, we can see that she's not able to uh, abduct her left eye, uh, but she's able to do all other duction movements. Similarly, in the right eye, she's able to do all her duction movements except for abduction. And uh, coming to the binocular movements, version movements, she has a horizontal gaze fancy in which she's not able to look to either side when instructed to do so. Her uh, seventh cranial nerve, uh, the motor component was uh, absent, but her sensory component was intact. There was absence of uh, nasolabial fold uh, on both sides and absence of wrinkling of foreheads uh, on uh, both sides. We started to investigate by taking an X-ray of the left hand, which showed a shortening of the middle phalanx of the second, third, and fourth uh, uh, middle phalanxes of the second, third, and fourth digits, as seen in this X-ray. Uh, we also did a uh, echocardiogram and chest X-ray, which were normal, and the brain MRI of the brain was normal. The brainstem motor above potential was also normal. 
uh, we have instructed the child to tape her eyelids closed during sleep and uh, regularly use artificial tears. Uh, the child and her parents have been informed to review if she develops any danger signs, uh, such as blurring of vision, photophobia, or redness. And she has been scheduled for a, a sur corrective surgery of the brachycentactery and the adrenal phenomenon. My, these were my differential diagnosis. Um, Mobius syndrome is a rare genetic disorder which is uh, sporadic in incidence. Uh, as affected children are not able to express their emotions, they may feel isolated and uh, develop psychological disturbances as they grow up. Uh, due to the syndactyly, the child may not be able to use her hand properly and may need help with her uh, day-to-day lives. Uh, I'd like to conclude by saying, as with any other syndrome, early diagnosis and proper management significantly improves the quality of life of these children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Nani, you finished your presentation in 4 minutes and 29 seconds. Um, Dr. Chinmay. Uh, can I uh, go off video now because I'm having some problem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chinmay, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, nice presentation. You finished in time. Very good. Yeah. Uh, so, other uh, can you just tell us about the uh, other uh, deformities associated with the Mobius syndrome? I'm sorry, sir. Other deformities. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, they can have limb deformities uh, such as uh, syndactyly, brachydactyly, and uh, they can even have uh, polydactyly, sir. And uh, they can have a uh, uh, usually it's usually sixth and seventh cranial nerves which are involved. But even other cranial nerves such as uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 can be involved. But in our patient, it was not involved. Okay. You, uh, your, uh, one of the differential I saw is Poland syndrome. Is it associated with this or it's a differential? Uh, no, sir. Uh, it's not associated. But uh, because of, um, uh, we first initially suspected that because of the cranial nerve involvement. But then she didn't have any the other symptoms of uh, Poland syndrome, which is the unilateral uh, the muscle atrophy, uh, that is absence of the pectoral group of muscles, so she didn't have that. Okay, and uh, does she have features of uh, hypogonadism or uh, and mental retardation? Yeah, uh, no, sir. Uh, she was doing well in school, and her mental uh, health, uh, she was intelligent, seemed normal, and uh, she did not have. Uh, she was at the age of, uh, I think, eight when we saw her, so she didn't have any secondary sexual characters at that time, sir. Oh, okay, and last question, just. Yes, uh, one answer. Uh, is it a progressive disease or? No, sir. No, sir. It's not progressive. It's oh, okay, fine. That's it from, from my side. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted to know. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you're kind of breaking up. I'm extremely sorry. I have poor connection. Okay, okay. No, I just wanted to ask, do you know the categories yes, of Mobius syndrome? Categories, ma'am. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not aware. Okay, okay. And uh, was it a, is it a genetic or sporadic disease? Uh, it's just, uh, there are uh, familial forms, but most part it's a sporadic disease, ma'am. Uh, it uh, usually affects chromosome 3 and 13. Okay, any uh, genetic computations you know of which affect uh, which can cause this? I'm sorry, ma'am, I couldn't uh, hear your question. Uh, any uh, genetic uh, like uh, chromosomal abnormality you know of which uh, can affect and present as Mobius? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, um, chromosome 13, if there's a uh, loss of the P, um, uh, it can present as a Mobius syndrome. Okay, uh, there are two genetic permutations actually, Hox A1 and Hox B1, generally mm -hmm. on uh, 17Q21. Okay. So, most commonly associated is this if it is genetic, uh, but as you mm -hmm. said, most commonly it is sporadic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what is the treatment uh, that you gave to this patient? Treatment, treatment that you offered. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, what was the treatment line that you offered to the patient? Ma'am, uh, the reason that they actually came in was uh, for a URI, ma'am. Uh, they came to the pediatric OCD and uh, along with that, the mother complained that she is not able to own it properly and uh, that's causing kind of uh, some problems in her school. So the thing that they actually wanted was uh, for her speech to become normal. They weren't that much uh, concerned about the syndactyly, ma'am. But then we told them that the syndactyly can be repaired and uh, it can, she can lose all the fingers. So we have planned for surgery, but they have not yet decided whether they want to continue. Okay, so how was the IQ of the kid? IQ seemed uh, normal, ma'am. She scores around 70 to 80 in her school exams and uh, she was able to uh, communicate properly except uh, for her uh, speech uh, which was a bit uh, uh, we had to we had to get used to her ma'am but she was able to read and write and uh, all her uh, domains seemed normal ma'am. Okay so does Mobius affect the intelligent question quotient? Uh, no ma'am usually it does not because it only affects the uh, cranial nerve nuclei uh, it doesn't affect much of the uh, other parts of it. Okay. Thank you, Manami. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Manami. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, do we have Akash Pandey? Good morning. <coughs> yeah. Um, you can let me know when you're ready. I'll start. Okay, sure. Yes. So, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, good morning to one and all present here. My, I'm Akash Pandey, a medical intern at Dr. RPGMC uh, Tanda, Himachal Pradesh. So, the case I bring before you is body stock anomaly. Uh, body stock anomaly is a severe defect of abdominal wall in which there is uh, extrophy of abdominal organs and in severe or in severe cases, even thoracic uh, organs as well. Uh, it is accompanied by a short rudimentary umbilical cord, which may be non-existent in some of the cases. Uh, in those cases, it remains attached directly to the placenta. So the pre prevalence of this uh, case is 1 in 14,000 to 1 in uh, 42,000 pregnancies and male fetuses are affected more than the female fetuses. So the obstetric history uh, shows an intrauterine death uh, in a 29-year-old secondary gravida. Uh, she was a bookcase, no history of consanguinity. Uh, there's no relevant medical history to be emphasized in this case. Uh, the first child was a male, uh, three years, uh, with no abnormalities and with normal uh, vaginal delivery. Uh, there was no history of unprescribed drug intake or radiation exposure. Uh, IUD detection uh, was done in second visit to the hospital. Uh, so in 20 weeks of gestation, uh, abortus, male abortus was delivered with crown rump length of 11 centimeters and crown head length of 18 centimeter. Uh, it has a short umbilical cord of uh, 2.5 centimeters. And obviously the, uh, the part, of, uh, part of placenta was you know, attached to the abdominal wall as seen in this case. Uh, we see a placenta, a very short uh, umbilical cord, and uh, associated with this disease, we can see a uh, telepus equinovirus. So the organs present outside the body, as seen in the image, are uh, uh, distended intestines. We can see hypolubulated <coughs> kidneys, uh, a liver, and uh, a short umbilical cord. Certain organs like uh, spleen, testicles, and the stomach were also present outside the body. So on dissection, we found a pulmonary hyperplasia, uh, deformed heart, uh, thymus was present, esophageal stenosis. We can see distended intestines again. And in this image, this clearly uh, kyphoscoliosis is visible <coughs> associated with the body stock anomaly. Now, about etiopathogenesis, not much is known about etiopathogenesis of BSA. Uh, certain mechanisms have been uh, proposed. Uh, however, the main mechanism is still not unclear. Uh, we know that karyotype is uh, mostly this, uh, not affected in most of the cases and uh, environmental factors play an important role. Still, three major theories have been proposed. Uh, the first and most accepted theory is early amnion rupture with mechanical pressure and amniotic bands. Second is vascular disruption of the early embryo. And the third is uh, journey, uh, germinal disc abnormality while you know, folding uh, craniocaudal and uh, lateral folding of the uh, germinal disc. 
there's a disputed theory uh, that says due to short umbilical cord and uh, fetal mal positioning uh, it, that can cause limb defects and uh, spinal defects but it does not explain much about pulmonary malformation and defect in abdominal wall so in our case uh, no risk factors were actually uh, found uh, during history taking but uh, possible risk factors are uh, drug, drug abuse like uh, tobacco cocaine marijuana alcohol and also twin pregnancy so the, the diagnosis of the condition can be made as soon as 12 weeks by ultrasonography uh, in which a mid sagittal view of the fetus can show atrophy of abdominal organs and uh, nuchal translucency also helps in the diagnosis and another is uh, measuring the level of alpha veto protein in maternal serum mainly in second trimester so it is very important to you know take in account uh, other differentials while diagnosing body stock anomaly like omphalocele gastroschisis vesical atrophy uh, contral pentology pen, uh, amniotic band syndrome and beckwith weidman syndrome a complication associated with the disease are risk to maternal health preterm labor hypertensive pregnancy uh, specific diseases now uh, in a study daskalski uh, et all studies uh, 106757 fetuses between uh, 10 and 14 weeks of gestation in which incidence of 1 in 7500 pregnancies was found which is not in par with the uh, incidence i told you in the beginning which was 1 in 42000 so that that means more, this body stock anomaly causes is maybe the cause of uh, most of the spontaneous abortions we see in our clinics and uh, bsa as we know is in, uh, invariably con- incompatible with life so it is essential to make an early diagnosis <clears throat> so that it prevents suffering of the mother and the uh, mother baby and the family so more research is required for the occurrence and cause of the disease and uh, fetal autopsies must be you know promoted to uh, study more about the disease so that is, uh, that's all from my side thank you uh thank you akash uh, you've taken 5 minutes and 10 seconds uh dr chinmay sir hello akash Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. No, you you said in this case there was intrauterine de- death. Yes, sir. So why was it not diagnosed in a prenatally means antenatal uh, workup? Sir, the the, the patient uh, the diagnosis was made in the second visit of the patient. Uh, I live, actually live in Himachal Pradesh. There uh, people from uh, people coming from uh, places like Chamba. These are very remote places where people okay. not are not very you know. Uh, fond of going for uh, antenatal visits. I've even seen patients coming for the first visit and delivering just in the labor room. So, yeah, uh, diagnosis could not be made because of uh, patient was not uh... in the first visit. Everything was normal. Yes, sir. In the first visit, everything was normal. In the second visit, uh, the IUD was uh, diagnosed. Okay. 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 Any any uh, uh, any association with the genetic disorder? This one. uh sir body stock and only stock. is not really associated with uh, any genetic disorders as, uh, it is more like uh, environmental factors are more associated still sometimes uh, in some places uh, placental trisomy 16 or maternal uniparental trisomy 16 were seen uh, but they were not very relevant with it, with the case okay okay and uh, in this what is the age of the mother mother so she was 29 year old secondary gravida Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, this condition is always fatal. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ah, uh, Doctor Niranjini. Yes. Ah, uh, good afternoon, Akash. Ah, uh, Akash, I wanted to ask, what are the causes of the body stock deformity? Ah, uh, as in you say. sorry ma'am do you mean sorry yeah um am i audible now akash uh, yes ma'am yeah i just wanted to ask as you said uh, it is not genetical so what are the possible causes of uh, body stock deformity then possible <coughs> possible causes can be uh, uh 
uh, drug abuse uh, during antenatal uh, period like uh, tobacco, cocaine, alcohol, or marijuana. Twin pregnancy can cause uh, this disease. <clears throat> and uh, uh, inherited de defects in uh, lamina folding and uh, vascular disruption can also cause body stock anomaly. Okay, and what are the sonographic findings they found antenatally? Ma'am, uh, sonographic findings we see uh, in mid sagittal region there is uh, extrophy of uh, abdominal organs outside the body, uh, especially um, if uh, like in umphalocele or gastroschisis, we just see a gut loop coming outside the body. But in body stock anomaly, liver and uh, stomach uh, and spleen. And uh, if in case of a male uh, fetus, uh, testicles can also be seen outside the body in the um, you know, amniotic cell. Uh, uh, any differentials that you know of? Maybe yes, omphalocele, gastrocysis, central ventology, and. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. So, uh, is it compatible with life, this deformity? No, ma'am, it is invariably incompatible with life. Okay, okay. thank you, Akash. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Akash. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, to we have Imad Rahman. Yes. Hi, uh, one sec. Uh, just a second. I'm not sure if I'm able to uh, screen share. One second. Oh. Uh. I is the screen visible? One second. Not yet. One second. actually trying to but uh, there's some issue with my mac okay no worries uh, let's uh I'm, in the meantime i'm just gonna call the next participant we'll figure out what to do um next we have shilpa raman uh shilpa i am ready yes shilpa uh you can go ahead Can I share my screen? Yes, yes. Is it visible? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Is it visible now? Yeah, we can see now. Hello everyone, I'm Shilpa Raman from Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. I would like to present a case on stroke, which is Bollenberg syndrome, also known as lateral medullary syndrome. Uh, lateral medullary syndrome is called Wallenberg syndrome. It's the most typical posterior circulation stroke syndrome. It is caused most commonly by a stroke in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery or the part of the vertebral artery. Uh, my case is a 60 year old male patient came with the chief complaints of giddiness since one day, swaying to the right side while walking and slurring of speech since one day. The patient was apparently asymptomatic one day back. Then he developed giddiness, which was sudden in onset, progressive and not associated with positional variation. Then he developed slurring of speech. No history of seizures or vomiting. And there is no history of chest pain, palpitation, speed edema. And there's no history of fever, cough or cold. There is also no history of decreased urine output. 
past history. He is a known case of ischemic CVA with the right hemiparesis. It is not a known case of uh, hypertension, coronary artery disease, tuberculosis, and epilepsy. On examination, the patient is conscious, coherent, and cooperative. Uh, his BP is 140-80 millimeters of mercury. Pulse is 80 per minute, and uh, SpO2 is 96. And uh, paleoictrous sinuses, clubbing, pedal edema were absent. On systemic examination, higher mental functions are normal. And on cranial nerve examination, cranial nerve 1 and 2 are normal. And on third nerve examination, uh, there was a uh, drooping on right side and uh, meiosis is seen on right side. Rest everything was normal. And on uh, fifth, uh, fifth cranial nerve examination, there was a uh, decreased sensation of pain and temperature on right side of the face. Rest everything was normal. Cranial nerve 6 and 7 were normal. And on eighth nerve examination, uh, there was a uh, uh, abnormality noted in the vestibular component of the right side and on uh, cranial of 9 and 10th examination were normal. Sorry, they were not normal. Ovula is deviated to the left side and the gag reflex is severely decreased. Cranial of 11 and 12 were normal. On motor system examination, tone, power and reflexes were normal. And on sensory, uh, sensory examination, there was loss of pain and temperature on the left side of the body with intact vibration and proprioception. The right side of the body has intact pain, temperature, vibration, proprioception. On cerebellar examination, there was uh, swaying towards right side on walking. And on investigations, T2 flare hyperintensity was noted. CT was done, there was no bleed. And uh, diffusion weighted MRI was taken. There was a restriction on diffusion weighted MRI with the uh, corresponding lower low values on ADC noted in the right side of medulla, suggestive of acute impact. These were images taken. And on uh, MR angiography, there was a uh, loss of uh, flow void noted in right vertebral artery and right uh, uh, pica, suggestive of lateral medullary syndrome. Uh, my differential diagnosis was uh, bulbar palsy and acute labyrinthitis. And finally, this was my diagnosis, lateral medullary syndrome, first uh, discovered by Adolf Wallenberg, and it's known as Wallenberg syndrome. Uh, my patient was given uh, aspirin and clopidab, each of uh, sorry, 300 mg, and then uh, asked to follow up. Finally, time is brain in my stroke. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. Uh, we've taken three minutes and 50 seconds. Um, Dr. Niranjan, ma'am. Uh, Niranjan, ma'am. Shilmai, sir. Hello. Yes. So Hello, you said sir. there was no risk factor in this case. No Actually, hypertension. Yeah, no. I think age was a risk factor in this age. How old is he? 60 year old. 60, okay. The risk factor is uh, age. One is there. Can you show the yes. uh, this one? Uh, your uh, 8 and 9, 10th uh, examination yes. slide. So, in by vestibular component, how do you assess the vestibular component? Uh, we'll see for nystagmus attacks on nystagmus Okay, uh, attacks. Yeah. Uh, how will you check for the, uh, there are uh, two types of nystagmus? So can you just elaborate uh, central versus peripheral if you are able to tell? Yeah. So we'll put some uh, warm water in the ear and then check for nystagmus. Okay. We'll see whether it is uh, moving towards an opposite side of the ear. Okay. Okay. So the, and uh, 11, 12th are normal, you said. 11 and 12th are normal. Yeah, in the pupil pupillary reflex, you said, instead of pupillary reflex, should be pupil only, not reflex. Pupillary okay, reflex so. will be different. The size is yeah, pupillary yeah. size. Is... Yeah, size of the pupil. Yeah. Okay, so how, uh, uh, so currently, how is the patient? Oh, uh, he is now okay, but uh, like slurring of speech is still present. Are you uh, planning to refer him to for uh, occupational yeah, so, or 
speech therapy we yeah sir we advised him to go for a speech therapy and uh, we also asked him if we have if he has any difficulty in swallowing and uh, anything he can come to us anytime okay any uh, uh, dysphonia dysarthria is there yeah uh, like slurring of speech was present that's it and uh, nothing more sir. okay okay so any uh, anti co- co- coagulant or anti platelet drug has been started yeah aspirin and clopidogrel was started sir 300 mg uh, at the first dose and then it was converted into 75 mg aspirin now okay and clopidogrel oh uh, it was remote sir Sing- he is on a single aspirin anti platelet now only single yeah okay okay fine thank you sir thank you sir uh niranjani ma'am uh hello ma'am okay uh i guess ma'am uh is a little busy uh thank you uh thank you so much next uh do we have imad oh uh, yes yes i'm here Okay. Am I audible and am I visible? Ah, uh, just a second. हेलो हेलो कैन यू एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस यू आर ऑडिबल यू आर ऑडिबल आई एम रियली सॉरी फॉर द डिले um actually rena i just wanted to ask uh, that uh, what is the culprit artery in wallenberg syndrome uh ma'am uh, it is vertebral artery and the pica ma'am posterior inferior cerebellar artery okay okay and uh, what are the main presenting symptoms ma'am main presenting main present symptoms. okay uh, it is uh, swaying towards uh, right side and starting of the speech <laughs> uh okay any other symptoms that you know of uh yeah um, um, uh, there can be a uh, ipsilateral loss of sensation of face there can be loss of taste uh, from anterior to third of tongue uh there can be dysphagia hoarseness palatal palsy uh there can be autonomic syndrome due to the involvement of 10th nerve uh yeah. there can oh, be uh, ho- horner syndrome that is what i wanted to ask that what is the symptom at our working the syndrome it uh, okay okay thank you sir thank you ma'am
Hello. Um, is there any technical glitch or uh, am I yes, only not able to see the presentation? I think there is a technical glitch. I think they are sorting it out. Okay, so no worries. Uh, is my screen visible right now? Uh, okay. Uh, now I'll be sharing Dr. Imad's presentation. Okay. Uh, is it? Is it visible now? Uh, can someone tell me if it's visible? Yeah, yeah, Imad, it's visible. Okay, thank you. Okay. So just a second, uh, I'm extremely sorry for the glitch. Uh, uh, so am I visible and am I audible? Yes, your screen is visible and you are audible. Uh, so I'm starting now. Good morning. This is Dr. Imad. I'm one of the uh, doctors who's graduated from UCMS and GTB Hospital, New Delhi. And my case is primary small cell carcinoma of the gallbladder. So uh, one second to figure a way out uh, yeah so uh, coming to the background uh, story before we get to the exact case 
my case is exactly related to a neuroendocrine tumor so neuroendocrine tumors mostly arise from the respiratory or the gi tract in both cases the cells of origin are something what we call as kolchitsky cells or the ec cells the absence of these cells in the gall bladder is what makes the tumor that i am going to talk about an extremely rare entity neuroendocrine tumors secrete markers called synaptophysin chromogranin and neuron specific enolase nse which can be extremely helpful diagnostically and they also secrete peptide hormones like serotonin somatostatin and gastrin which are the reason for many of their symptoms as we'll see coming to the case uh, we have a 67 year old male who presented to the hospital with complaints of multiple episodes of intractable diarrhea and vomiting for the past 2 weeks the diarrhea was 3 to 4 times a day and was large volume with no blood pus mucus and stools the patient has no history of fever since the onset of symptoms and no complaints of foul smelling bulky stools no history of straining no outside food ingestion no jaundice or prolonged antibiotic use the patient did not have any similar complaints in the past and now talking of the vomiting the vomiting was 2 to 3 episodes per day non projectile with watery content mixed with the ingested food and there was no history of blood in the vomitus no blurring of vision no headaches there was no history of weight loss or decrease in appetite before since the onset of symptoms and the patient is a known diabetic and hypertensive on medications on the examination perspective everything was normal uh, on the general physical on the vitals and uh, the general physical examination also came out to be normal the cardiovascular system was normal barring an ecg finding of left ventricular hypertrophy according to the socolo lyon criteria the cns the respiratory examination was also normal barring which a uh, gi examination i suspected the diarrhea and vomiting we had to perform a gi examination which showed tenderness in the right upper quadrant increasing on inspiration barring that everything else was normal the investigations revealed a normal initial blood count and a kft with the sodium slightly on the lower side and a potassium normal calcium also slightly on the lower side urea creat to be normal we had to go for a usg whole abdomen which revealed a mass of 1.3 into 1 0.5 into 2.8 cm arising from the gall bladder extending into the liver with surrounding lymphadenopathy now following this up we did a whole body pet scan which revealed a metabolically active heterogeneously enhancing ftg avid eccentric mural lesion noted at the body and fundus of the gall bladder and it also extended to the 4a and 4b segments of the liver the metabolically active peripancreatic and portocable lymph nodes as well now uh, since we were suspecting a tumor a uh, histopathology post radical cholecystectomy revealed a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor which was of the type of small cell carcinoma arising from the gall bladder now whenever we suspect a neuroendocrine tumor we go for ihc markers which revealed a uh, ck positivity cd56 four positive synaptophysin was positive lymph nodes were positive perineural invasion was positive as well as lymph nodes 6 out of 14 were there tumor markers of ca19.9 and cea were also present to be normal now differentials i've clubbed them into two gross categories of a gross and radiological differentials and histological differentials as seen below the most likely differentials that we consider as anthogranulomatous cholecystitis and since uh, there was tenderness in the right upper quadrant maybe cholecystitis as well uh my final diagnosis came out to be a metastatic small cell carcinoma of the gall bladder with a staging of t3 n2 and the management the patient was planned for a radical cholecystectomy on 15th of july this year and specimen for histopathological diagnosis with ihc markers was sent and came out to be small cell carcinoma of bladder the case was discussed with the tumor board of the hospital and planned for platinum based chemotherapy four cycles followed by radiotherapy now in the end i have a 60 uh, as a summary i have a 60 year old uh, gentleman who presented with multiple episodes of vomiting and loose stools for 2 weeks and was hemodynamically stable on assessment patient was evaluated uh, uh, with investigations revealing a mass in the gall bladder confirmed with the pet ct and a radical cholecystectomy was performed followed by histopathological examination revealing a metastatic small cell carcinoma of the gall bladder which indeed is a very rare entity with a poor prognosis the clinical presentation of this tumor is non specific and overlaps with other types of gall bladder malignancies and the who classifies this tumor into poorly differentiated and well differentiated even though both are of high grade lesions and of poor prognosis thank you Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, really sorry about my neck. I'm back. Uh, judges are uh, Dr. Chinmay sir. Yeah, Imad, uh, nice presentation. 
suppose uh, you uh, suppose this uh, on clinically can you hear me amad yes sir loud and clear yeah suppose clinically you diagnosed as a acute cholecystitis and you went inside with a laparoscopic uh, laparoscopically and uh, you found that there is a tumor now what would you do sir even if there would have been a tumor on acute cholecystitis post uh, lap coli what we would have done is we would have still uh, on we would have done an ultrasound which would have initially revealed a mass in the gallbladder but even though as you mentioned that if would it would not have revealed a mass in the gallbladder we would still have gone on to do a pet ct since the we we were we were finding a tumor post cholecystectomy as well and that would have revealed a 4a 4b segment or metastasis to the periportal and portocaval lymph nodes in the body okay and uh, in uh, radical cholecystectomy what structures you have been uh, you have removed in sir uh, of course the gallbladder the lymph nodes surrounding that area along with the 4a and 4b segments of the liver 4b mainly 4b and what is the prognosis for this uh, gallbladder carcinoma sir this type of gallbladder carcinoma is supposed to have a poor prognosis because it's one very rare as an entity and it responds poorly to the chemo based regimen as well and any risk factor in this case sir not in this case uh, patient was a known diabetic and hypertensive apart from that there was no other there was no risk factor for this case to have it was an incidental finding just because of the diarrhea and vomiting which we had evaluated for this patient Okay, what are the risk factors, sir? Uh, for gallbladder carcinoma, non-specifically, if it's adenocarcinoma, which comes out in most of the cases of gallbladder carcinoma, the risk factor includes gallbladder polyps, uh, adenomyosis, uh, uh, gallbladder polyps, adenomyosis, recurrent gallbladder stones, and uh, uh, these are the main risk factors, and uh, maybe family history as well. Okay. And why do you think that patient had uh, tenderness in the right upper quarter, sir? It could have been possible that uh, there would have been some amount of inflammation that could have uh, been present along with the irritation of the peritoneum that could have caused uh, maybe the localized uh, tenderness in that case. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Niranjani, ma'am. Uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what was your what was the follow up of your patient? Ma'am, so this patient was followed up with recurrent uh, values of tumor markers, and because the patient was known to have a poor response with the type of cancer that he's had. we were not expecting a very good response which we did not expect because the chemo response the patient was not responding very well there were metastases which were there with uh, which were there subsequently as well with the pet cts that we had performed so i had put up only the initial pet ct but later on the presence of the disease was not regressing rather it was present in the same places of 4a and 4b segments and the lymph nodes were aggressively present okay um so uh, what is the Uh, survival uh, span of this kind of patients generally ma'am so generally the case that i have presented is a extremely rare entity because as per data it's less than 0.1% of occurrence in gallbladder malignancies not gallbladder conditions gallbladder malignancies and as per my mm-hmm. knowledge there are only about 70 small cell ga- uh, gallbladder cancers that have been report- reported worldwide so uh, of course it's a very very poor prognosis but uh, as far as i have followed up this patient thrice and the patient was not i would say deteriorating but symptomatically we were trying to manage it to the best of our capacity only palliative care yes ma'am palliative care okay okay thank you okay uh, thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am uh ne- uh nagu pranit are you there uh yes i am yes uh you can go next is the screen visible now i would like to thank you 
Yeah, it's Mr. But I would like the presenters to please switch on their cameras during their presentations. The justice. So, am I visible? <clears throat> yes, yes. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess it's noon already. But still, uh, good morning. Uh, my case is uh, left uh, tardy Anna Novansi that uh, presented uh, after a non union uh, of the lateral condyle of the left humerus uh, 10 years later. Uh, coming to the case directly, uh, my patient is a 17 years old male who is brought to the OPD with the following chief complaints, uh, which include uh, uh, stiffness and deformity of the left elbow uh, since 10 years and paresthesia of the left little finger since 10 years and difficulty in using in the left upper limb since 10 years. Uh, chain was apparently normal uh, 10 years ago when uh, deformity was observed in his left elbow uh, associated with stiffness of the same elbow as well as paresthesia of the little finger. Uh, the deformity was insidious in one second, gradually progressive with the uh, limitation of the daily living activities. And uh, stiffness is also insidious in one second, gradually progressive, increasing with rest and uh, decreasing with activity. There, there was a history of uh, pain in the left elbow on the middle side. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Uh, they, there was a history of uh, intermittent pain on the left elbow, uh, specifically on the medial side uh, that is not radiating uh, anywhere, uh, even along the root of the nerve, and uh, uh, it is aggravated with activity and related with rest, similar to uh, uh, stiffness of the elbow. Uh, coming to the past element history, there was a history of uh, trauma in the childhood at the age of three years, uh, followed by immobilization of the same limb for about a month. Uh, the patient takes mixed diet and apparent bowel bladder sleep, everything is normal. Uh, coming to the relevant treatment history, uh, after the traumatic injury, there was no history of massages over the elbow, which probably ruled out some myositis of significance. And uh, coming to the general examination, the patient was co conscious, coherent, and well oriented without any failure, victor sinuses, clubbing, edema, or lymphadenopathy. And the patient is well built and well nourished, although vitals are within the limits. Coming to the local examination, uh, checking the uh, on inspection, the attitude of the elbow. Uh, shows cubitus valgus deformity, whereby the elbow is uh, pointing towards the body and the uh, distal part of the upper limb is pointing away from the body, which denotes a valgus deformity. Uh, there are no scars, sinuses, or swellings, or any pulsations in the cubital fossa. Uh, another uh, uh, visible feature is a um, muscle wasting that is seen on the left forearm, arm, as well as on the hand per se. And, uh, there is no fullness uh, over the ankle and triangle. Uh, uh, there is a wasting of the triceps that can be noted without any visible scars or sinuses. The three bony point, al uh, bony point relationship of the elbow is altered. On the right side, uh, everything is normal. Uh, on palpation, there is uh, no significant finding. Specifically, there is no local raise of temperature or any tenderness or uh, ala no thickening or fullness or swellings over uh, areas such as the para olecranon region or the ankle and triangle. Etc. and the epitrochanthal implants are not palpable as well. Coming to the uh, movements of the upper limb, um, the, uh, both of the right and left upper limb uh, for, uh, movements fall within the normal range of motion, except that the left upper limb uh, as, at the elbow joint uh, has got a fixed flexion deformity, uh, whereby the patient uh, cannot extend his uh, um, left upper limb uh, beyond 30 degrees. Uh, there is a like uh, deformity that has been fixed uh, at uh, 30 degree flexion beyond which he cannot extend his uh, limb and crepitus is present throughout the range of motion. Measurements of the limb, uh, true length, the arm, the forearm length, uh, everything is uh, similar on both the sides and the huter triangle of elbow uh, is uh, normal uh, and there is a specific muscle wasting of one centimeter in the left arm as well as in the forearm. Uh, considering the absence of the pain and the three bony point relationship altered, uh, it is probably the non-union of the lateral condyle, uh, which was probably neglected at the time of injury and now presenting, presented with uh, uh, Anna now fancy. Investigations uh, include the general investigations, which are normal, and the X-ray of the elbow joint uh, showed the medial condyle overgrowth, uh, probably because the lateral growth of uh, lateral epicondyle is 
fractured and the growth is impaired. That can be noted on this X-ray. Uh, a nerve conduction study was done since the patient had paresthesias over the left upper limb and specifically in the ulnar nerve distributions and that nerve conduction study demonstrated decrease of nerve conduction velocity. Uh, after these investigations, so we can confirm that it is a tardy ulnar nerve palsy uh, prob probably after the non-union of the lateral condyle of the humerus. Uh, treatment was planned and uh, the, uh, the ulnar nerve uh, transposition was done to relieve the ulnar nerve palsy. Uh, it is a tension releasing procedure uh, uh, that will uh, probably reduce the paresthesia and uh, weakness of the left upper limb. Uh, the deformity was not corrected since the patient wasn't ready to undergo the osteotomy procedure. In the post operatively, the paresthesia over the ulnar nerve distribution was uh, resolved. Uh, if you can see the post operative image of this patient. Uh, uh, coming to the discussion sections, uh, this tardy ulnar palsy, as the name implies, the tardy itself is a late uh, refers to something which is late occurring, and uh, tardy ulnar palsy is uh, obviously a chronic uh, clinical condition that is characterized by ulnar neuropathy after an injury. Uh, since it typically occurs after uh, uh, non-union of the lateral condyle, uh, it is uh, almost always associated with the cubitus valgus deformity. And when the chain grows with uh, when the chain grows uh, uh, with age, the deformity will uh, worsen and the uh, uh, nerve may imp imp impaired even even more uh, due to further stretching. There are uh, other causes of uh, cardiac nerve palsy, but all of them are due to some trauma or fracture dislocations around the uh, elbow joint, such as a supracondylar fracture or fractures of the medial condyle, etc. One thing to be noted is that the uh, Intrinsic uh, muscle uh, atrophy of the hand is not always present in ulnar neuropathy, and uh, sensory symptoms sh should also give uh, a light into the ulnar palsy. And as already said, this anti uh, transposition of ulnar nerve is a tension releasing procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, you've taken uh, six minutes and 35 seconds. Um, Dr. Chinmay, sir. Hello, Pranit. Hello. Sir. Yeah, uh, so in this case, uh, trauma was uh, 10 years back. Uh, no, sir. Trauma was uh, when the patient was three years of age and uh, 10 years ago, the, uh, the deformity was noted. Okay, so that's why you are causing tardy. Yes. It is delayed. Yes. So, uh, what is the average uh, uh, after how many years the tardina uh, ulnar nerve palsy develops on an average? Uh, uh, probably uh, seven to ten years, sir. But I'm not sure of the number. Yeah, okay. Uh, it generally develops after fifteen years. Pardon, sir. It generally develops after fifteen years. Okay. Sir. Oh. And uh, what is the mechanism uh, by which this lateral condyle fracture can occur? Mechanism of injury. Uh, uh, it is probably due to fall on outstretched hand or fall on the lateral uh, lateral side of the elbow joints. Correct, correct. And uh, this one, uh, the what are the complications? And uh, if the, do you know any classification for this uh, lateral condyle fracture? No, sir. I'm not. And uh, in what cases do you prefer uh, open surgical reduction? Uh, if the fracture joint is exposed uh, or if uh, there is a di uh, associated uh, dislocation uh, with, uh, uh, with the fracture surface exposed outside or if there is a foreign body. No. And what uh, other than transposition, what is the other uh, uh, management options you can consider? Um, we can probably go for a nerve lengthening procedures. Okay. Anything other than that? You said crepitus is there. Why do you think crepitus is there? Uh, it is uh, probably because of the non-union uh, and uh, uh, and there is impingement between bones uh, during the range of movement. Okay, uh, so if you remove that impingement, uh, will it uh, reverse? Uh, no, uh, the deformity will not be reversed, sir, but uh, the ulnar nerve palsy may be reversed. Okay. 
ओके ओके उंड Commonly than that median. Okay. Any others? The most common. I'm I'm not aware. Um, actually, a radial nerve uh, in the supracondylar and mid shaft fractures. It's most commonly involved, and oh. uh, axillary nerve can be involved in the proximal shaft fractures. So, do you know how do you test uh, these nerves? clinically uh yes ma'am uh, axillary nerve can be tested by asking the patient to uh, lift the uh, shoulder joint uh, from 0 to 15 degrees uh, which is controlled by deltoid muscle or uh, we can go for uh, testing of sensation over the regimental badge area for the okay. radial nerve we can test for the extensors of the forearm okay sensory For sensory aspect, we can uh, test the uh, distal, uh, uh, the lateral aspect of the extensor side of the, or the posterior side of the palm. Palm or the lateral two and a half fingers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pani. Um. Next to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Just a second. Okay. Uh, next to we have Romana. Yeah, I'm there. Ah, uh, Romana. Okay, Romani. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Just a second. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Go. You can best. Yeah, is my screen visible? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start my presentation now. Yeah, I'm Gumbadi Saishri, an intern from Guntur Medical College, and my today's presentation is Wilkie syndrome, an unusual presentation. And a 55-year-old female homemaker named Yadida Ratnam, resident of Amalapuram, presented to our hospital with the following chief complaints, which are the abdominal discomfort, two episodes of vomiting. Since twenty days and decreased appetite since twenty days, abdominal discomfort was sudden in, so, in onset with the duration of twenty days, and as well as uh, there is bloating sensation and blisters few hours after taking food, which are relieved on vomiting. Vomitings are usually two episodes per day with the duration of twenty days, and it only happens whenever she takes a solid food, and there are no vomitings whenever she takes a liquid food. And the vomitings contain partially digested food, yellowish to green in color, which are and it's not blood stained. and they are actually foul smelling also and uh, and there are no any similar complaints in past but she is a known case of bronchial asthma and there are no any medication she is not taking any medications for it her personal history is normal except that the appetite is usually decreased obstetric history and menstrual history are normal according to her age general examination paler is present no clubbing ictus cyanosis or edema build is thin build nourishment is ill nourishment all the vitals are normal within the normal range and uh, the local examination involves the patient is present in supine position arms by side properly exposed from mid chest to mid thigh abdomen is flat no fullness or visible swellings umbilicus centrally located and inverted palpation is normal and no abnormalities except that there is tenderness present over the right hypochondrium and epigastrium Percussion, liver dullness not obliterated, and tympanic node is present. Auscultation, bowel sounds are present. 
colorectal examination and pervasional ex examination are normal. Provisional diagnosis is subacute small intestinal obstruction. Differential diagnosis can be mechanical obstruction such as bands, adhesions, strictures, and Crohn's disease, TB, abdomen, SM or SME. Investigations. First, we should start with x-ray erect abdomen. And uh, both the domes or diaphragm are normal. No air under the diaphragm. Next, we have then the Doppler USJ abdomen, which showed the narrow SMA angle and increased blood flow velocity through the SMA. And upper GI endoscopy showed dilated proximal part of duodenum, where rest of the findings are normal. And the angle between the SMA and the aorta is being narrowed. And here is an MRI, which is showing the compression of duodenum between those arteries. And the plan for this patient is laparotomy followed by retrocolic duodenogygnostomy. And uh, actually, duodenogygnostomy is usually better when compared to gastrogygnostomy. And post-operative management. And until POD A5, the stools and flatters are passed, but they, they rendered a complication such as green discharge from the wound is visible. And it was found to be due to Escherichia coli. And later, the, after uh, remaining six days, the wound site was leaked from the wound site was decreased and total parental nutrition continued and secondary suture done. And take home message was, it's actually a rare syndrome and we should uh, even uh, address uh, whether malnutrition and weight loss are present in this patient. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Saishri. Uh, you took three minutes and 36 seconds. Um, yeah. Ranjini, ma? Um, yes. Um, Saishri, uh, what yeah. is uh, yeah, well. the syndrome exactly defined on the MRI? How is it de defined on the MRI? Yeah, actually, the angle between, actually, the angle between SMA and uh, IOTA should be actually between 20 to 60, but it's actually between uh, 7 to 20 degrees. So the angle is decreased and also the length uh, is decreased. It should actually be 10 to 22 mm, but it's decreased. So by those findings, we can find in MRA that uh, duodenum is usually compressed. Oh. Oh, okay. Which part of the duodenum? Third part of the duodenum. Because it's supplied by right. SMA. Um, yes. And... Uh, what are the complications of uh, this? The Wilkie syndrome or uh, intestinal obstruction per se? Yeah, ma'am, because of that, uh, even uh, left renal vein entrapment syndrome will occur because the left renal vein also is present between those structures, IOTA and SMA. Mm -hmm. Any other complications? Uh, there may be aneroxia and malabsorption disorders. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if this patient was offered total parental nutrition, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what are the indications of the total parental nutri nutrition? What, ma'am? I can't hear you. Indications. Indications for starting total parental nutrition. Yeah, it's, uh, it's indicating whenever there is an impaired GI function and uh, whenever there is a contradiction to enteral nutrition. Okay, and the complications associated with total parental nutrition? Actually, there are no complications in this patient. Okay. Yeah. Um, but is there any complication of total parental nutrition when you give it to a patient that you should... Uh, Suspect, like, no, I have no idea, man. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe there may be electrolyte differences, electrolytic imbalances. There may be electrolytic imbalances or thrombosis. You don't always watch for these, correct? Exactly. And yeah. uh, um, what is your take on conservative management of this patient? Actually, uh, actually, most of the cases of uh, SMA doesn't. They, they doesn't respond to this uh, conservative treatment. Mm -hmm. So we actually need to do surgery. So even this patient didn't respond on uh, conservative treatment, ma'am. So we approach to do the surgery. 
Okay. Any other study uh, which mentions uh, initial conservative which have failed or something like that? Yeah, Any actually, it's mm -hmm. on PPIs uh, since uh, ten days, since twelve days. So there are no response. So we, as it's severe, as it's severe, and she's having severe abdominal pain and severe anorexia, we started doing surgery. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Chinmay, um, sir? Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, what is the normal age uh, normal age group for SMA syndrome? So, it's actually for elderly, elderly patients, sir. Actually, Between generally, it happens when the, there is vertical, uh, sudden vertical, uh, means uh, there is increase in a height, generally occurs in adolescent pa uh, patient. So once the height is increased, that angle reduces yeah, between yeah, the SMA yeah. and aorta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, a patient will present generally in adolescent. Yeah, okay, okay. And other uh, risk is uh, when there is a sudden weight loss, rapid weight loss. Yeah, yeah. So the angle between SMA and aorta. Cushioning goes. So why do you think yeah, yeah. in a fifty-five-year-old that SMA has occurred? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, that is one cause. Uh, have you tried to find out that uh, in a 55 year old lady why it is there? Yeah, there actually, is any... even differentiated uh, and other causes such as the cons disease or any any obstructions in uh, small bowel. But uh, actually, after doing the investigations, we came to find out that it's an SMA syndrome. No, okay. uh, uh, she's 55 year old, right? Yeah. yeah. And she's postmenopausal. Yeah, yeah, she's postmenopausal. Uh, there might be a possibility of compression from back to on the aorta. There might might be scoliosis or kyphosis, which is causing yeah. compression on the aorta, and that angle has been reduced. Have you considered that? Yeah, actually, she doesn't complain of any back pain. Okay. Yeah. So. She just said that it's just abdominal pain, non-projectile vomitings. So in a, so this patient comes to you at a follow up, long term follow up. What will you check for nutrition? Whether she's able to take it orally and uh, whether she's able to pass the stools normally okay. without any nutritionally. Kind of nutritionally means which nutritional deficit are you expecting in this? You said uh, there is gastro jejunal stomach versus duodenal jejunal stomach. Duodenal is, is better. Why? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I will ask uh, the same question indirectly. Yeah. So why uh, duodenal jejunal stomach is better than gastro jejunal stomach? Yeah, no idea. Sir. Oh, oh. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sai uh, Next, we have Domana. Yes. Yeah, uh, let me come in your writing. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I have issues with the PPT uh, from my system, so I made it as... Uh, on one slide. So, respected judges and all my dear colleagues, good afternoon to one and all. I'm Romana Riaz, an intern from Shardhan Institute of Medical Sciences from Hyderabad. Here today, my case is on fibrous dysplasia of the sphenoid sinus. Introduction, fibrous dysplasia or fibrous osteoma is a term used to describe a group of benign bony lesions. And uh, here, this paranasal sinuses are rarely involved. This local disease may cause destructive changes to one bone, so it is monostotic, or it can be affecting several bones, it is polystotic. And the onset is usually in late childhood, that is in adolescence. Currently, the etiology is not known, and several genetic mutations of uh, Gina's gene, and um, it can be associated with McCune Albright syndrome. Early di diagnosis is required. So here is the case. 
a 22 year old in uh, a 22 year old driver who uh, came to the ent department with chief complaints of nasal obstruction since 6 months initially it was left sided and has gradually progressed to become bilateral leading to mouth breathing and subsequently it, uh, he was breathing through the uh, mouth and it was associated with bilateral hyposmia more on the left side than on right side and associated with nasal discharge which was mucoid in consistency and has foul smell headache was seen in the headache was uh, headache was the another complaint in the occipital region since two years which was continuous and diffuse in nature it was more on bending forwards and relieved on taking medications and uh, he had left sided diplopia associated with decreased vision and it was gradually progressive Uh, he had gradual progressive proptosis of the left eye since 8 months uh, his previous history was uh, unremarkable whereas neurological examination was normal and on ophthalmic examination visual visual equity was decreased on the left side fundus examination and visual field testing were all normal investigations the routine blood investigations were in normal range limits and uh, to suspect uh, the uh, we had a differential diagnosis of maybe because of mucosal of the sphenoid sinus or allergic fungal sinusitis or it can be any uh, is no feel granuloma so for that we had to to rule out we uh, we had to go for the ct scan of the paranasal sinuses here you can see on the axial bone window ct scan there was an expansor lesion originating from the sphenoid bone and it was extending to the maxillary sinus this is a characteristic lesion of the ground glass appearance suggestive of the fibrous uh, dysplasia of the bone then uh, next similarly when histology of the uh, histology of the bone was taken there were irregular spicules and trabeculae of the bone with this stromal component containing fibroblastic spindle cells suggestive of fibrous dysplasia because it's a benign tumor and it had no malignancy malignancy characteristics hence we confirmed the diagnosis as uh, sphenoid sinus fibrous fibrous dysplasia of sphenoid sinus and for this uh, we uh, we pro we suggested of uh, going for uh, uh, surgery so we referred him to the neurosurgery but uh, from our department we gave uh, we provided conservative management of decongestants and allergic medications and corticosteroids done sir yeah uh thank you ramana You've taken uh, four minutes and forty-five seconds. Um, Doctor Chinmay sir. Hello, Romana. Uh, Hello, this patient had uh, any had any visual disturbances? Yes, sir. He had visual disturbances. Uh, left side was have like he had double vision, and uh, when we were checking for the visual equity, it was decreased on left side. Okay, and. Uh, what is the pathophysiology behind this fibrous dysplasia mostly uh, uh, it is uh, because of the there is genetic mutation there might be genetic mutations hmm. and also um basically this osteoblastic there is a Yeah, unregulated differentiation and maturation. So unregulated bone formation. Imbalance. Yeah, imbalance between all. So there is distortion of the bone for this one, and uh, so bone marrow tissue think? gets replaced with the fibrous tissue. Yeah, and one in one of your slides, I think you have mentioned that there is no uh, chance of uh, malignancy. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, osteosarcoma is one of the rarest uh, complication of uh, the uh, fibrous dysplasia. it can convert but it is very rare very rare yeah and what uh, what do you think the goals of the surgery should be to preserve the function yeah like the normal uh, nasal functions because breathing is the main uh, yeah. complaint yeah on any breathing. other goals and um, to preserve uh, to preserve the facial symmetry mild mm. uh, because when's the uh, when's this lesion gets Uh, progressed then they may be facial asymmetry and okay. cosmetically based and yeah. uh, one more and avoid any complications yeah to prevent complications yeah okay thank you so um nirantri ma'am Uh, yes, 
Good afternoon, Romana. I just Good afternoon. have one question from my side. Uh, you said that the patient was referred to the neurosurgery department for surgery. So, did he underwent the surgery and what kind of surgery did he undergo? No, ma'am. He, he refused surgery uh, as a... Uh, he was driver and by occupation and uh, if we have to go uh -huh. for uh, surgeries then um, it can be through uh, craniotomy like the basal craniotomy uh -huh. subcranial craniotomy mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, debulking by an endonasal mm -hmm. endonasal approach okay. it can be the uh, so what is the most common presenting complaints in uh, this kind of patients Fibrosis, plagia, spinoid sinus. Most common presenting complaints generally. Generally, uh, mostly these patients are asymptomatic. But when the when it progresses, then they can uh, they come with the symptoms of headache and uh, nasal uh, nasal complaints. Oh, uh, headache is the most common presenting feature, which doesn't subside generally on uh, regular medications. On regular medication, uh, ophthalmic complaints like this okay. disturbance, visual disturbances. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, do we have Tanishk? Uh, Tanishk. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Uditi Bandaru. Yes, uh, give me a minute and sit down. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. <laughs> Right. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm Uditi. I'm currently studying at Swims SPMC W Tirupati, third year. I'm presenting a case of granular metrosis with polyanthritis. This is the case of a 32-year-old female who presented with complaints of recurrent nasal bleeding from two years and bilateral edema of lower limbs from one month. Uh, the history of presenting illness. There was recurrent nasal bleeding from two years, which aggravated in the past six months with two to three episodes associated with nasal blockage and headache, bilateral edema of the lower limb involving half of the leg from the past one month, which aggravated from 10 days and is associated with swelling of the eyes from five days. No history of blood and urine, decreased urine output, frothing of urine, burning maturation, no history of fever, weight loss and chronic cough with expectoration, no history of skin rashes, infections, joint pains. Past history, there is no uh, history of similar complaints in the past, no history of diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, tuberculosis, asthma, thyroid disorders or malignancies, and no history of previous drug usage. Personal history, mixed diet, decreased sleep, so adequate uh, sleep and decreased appetite. Past uh, family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. Obstetric and menstrual history were normal. On clinical examination, the patient is conscious coherent, cooperative, and oriented to time, place, and person. The vitals, the patient is afebrile, and blood pressure is 160 by 110 millimeters of mercury, which is hypertensive. General examination showed mild failure and bilateral pitting pedal edema. Examination of nose showed a depressed nasal bridge or serial nose deformity, dried nasal mass with deviated nasal septum. Respiratory system examination showed bilateral crepitations on auscultation, cardiovascular system and nervous system examination findings were known. On investigations, laboratory investigations showed elevated serum creatinine, elevated 24-hour urine protein levels, uh, normal serum albumin levels, reduced hemoglobin levels, coagulation profile was all within the normal levels. On microbiological investigations, Mantu test was negative, which rules out tuberculosis. Urine and blood cultures were sterile, which rules out any possible infectious causes. Radiological investigations showed uh, as follows. 
uh, CTPNH should mucosal thickening, which was noted in the bilateral ethmoid left maxillary bilateral sphenoid sinuses, which suggested sinusitis. USG full abdomen showed bilateral grade three renal parenchymal disease, which is dilatation of calluses with bilateral hydronephrosis of kidney. Chest X-ray and CT chest both showed bilateral pleural effusion. This is the chest X-ray of the patient. Pathological investigations. The antibody titers, C anka antibody titers were positive. P anka and anti GBM antibodies were negative. Serum C3 and C4 complement proteins were within normal range. Nasal mass biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation. Renal biopsy was done based on abnormal renal function and C anka positivity. On histopathological examination, it showed chrysentric glomeruli and posi immune vasculitis, which leads us to the diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyanthractis. My differential diagnosis includes, since tuberculosis also presents with uh, chronic cough, uh, lung issues, and all, uh, chronic cough and uh, uh, expectoration, which is another presentation of it. So tuberculosis is one important differential diagnosis. Other infectious di differential diagnoses include fungal infections, infective endocarditis, bacterial pneumonia, other anchor-associated vasculitis like microscopic polyangiitis, chirk strauss syndrome, good pasture syndrome, henoxondine purpura, other autoimmune conditions which is associated with anchor positivity like systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, malignancies such as lymphomas, lymphomatide granulomatosis, drug toxicities include intranasal co uh, cocaine, amphetamines, levamisole, Management septoplasty was done for the correction of serial nose deformity. Hemodialysis and plasma pyrosis was recommended. Dietary advice to maintain at least 40 grams of daily protein intake and 1800 kilocalories per day. Medications are cyclophosphamide, prednisolone, amlodipine, prazosin, and metoprolol. Uh, so the patient has been undergoing patient has been undergoing hemodialysis for the past six months. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as Vechner's granulomatosis, is an uncommon disorder affecting the small and medium blood vessels. It's commonly associated with uh, upper and lower respiratory tract in, uh, manifestations, systemic vasculitis, and renal involvement. So, uh, I, so there are no uh, set diagnostic criteria for GPA, and it is based on a combination of clinical manifestations, positive uh, C anchor positivity and histological evidence. Anchor positivity is also associated with multiple other conditions uh, like systemic lupus erythematosus. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Are uh, you taking now uh, five minutes and ten seconds, um, Doctor Chinmay sir? Uh, Chinmay sir. Um, Niranjani ma'am. Yes. Um. Good afternoon, uh, Uditi. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, you said that the patient had lower leg pain, right? Um, and yes. edema. Yes. So you had described in your uh, examination that it was half of the leg. Half of the leg was still there. Like, yes, um, yes. The lower leg or the thigh? Uh, till the knee, ma'am. Till the knees? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, what is the pathophysiology of uh, the path uh, repeat? Uh, the etiology is unknown, but it can be triggered by infections like uh, HPV, HCV, and CMV, and Staph aureus infections, and certain genetic predispositions like uh, HLD mutations and mutations in uh, protein S3, PR3. Uh, the pathophysiology is that there is neutrophilic, uh, there's granulomatous inflammation, ma'am. Uh, there are granulomas formed consisting of giant cells surrounded with uh, uh, neutrophils, plasma cells. Uh, and these can uh, these are not well formed, so they can uh, infiltrate into the surrounding structures and supplements. Okay. So what is the role of plasma in these patients? 
Uh, Ma'am, here it's an autoimmune disease and uh, it, it contains antibodies like uh, PR3 anchor that is uh, C anchor. So to remove those antibodies, plasmapheresis is required to reduce the progress of the disease. Uh, that's what I'm Basically, it's a protective Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so what are the long-term medications that you provide to these patients? Sorry, ma'am. The medications that you provide on the chart. Um, ma'am, we give cyclophosphamide and uh, prednisolone, like high-end steroids, like prednisolone. Uh, in case of severe disease, and again, the, pay, the person can be maintained on methotrexate as a thioprine and prednisolone. In case of non-severe disease, methotrexate is uh, methotrexate or prednisolone. Oh, okay. And uh, was the uh, lower limb Doppler done to rule out DVT? Yes, ma'am. It, yes, ma it was done. There was no DVT. Why we need to rule out DVT specifically in Edmunds? Sorry. Why do we rule out DVT in vaginals? Uh, Ma'am, because it involves the vessels. So there's vasculitis. In and there are high chances of thrombosis. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Hello? Hi, Am I yes, audible? Sir. Yes, sir. Um, hi, sir. Yeah, uh, so how do you establish the diagnosis of wage nuts? Uh, so uh, we first of all suspected tuberculosis based on uh, the non-specific findings because tuberculosis is very common. So <clears throat> we did Mantu test and CPNAT, it was negative. After that, we assessed for the antibodies because we tested for all the other possible diagnoses. Then we came to uh, antibody titers, that is... Uh, the C anchor positivity, serum C3, C4 proteins, and uh, anti GVM antibodies. So. Okay, any differences were kept? Sorry, sir. Any other differentials were kept other than uh, tuberculosis? Uh, so, other differentials, uh, other differentials were like uh, gran other granulomatous anchor associated vascular types like uh, Chirk Strauss syndrome. Uh, Good pasture syndrome, anti GBM antibodies were assessed, so. okay. and any other autoimmune conditions like systemic lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis. So, any imaging study would uh, help in the diagnosis? Uh, so, the, it's based on uh, CT chest. So, CT chest, um, there will be some uh, pulmonary cavitations or infiltrates present. Uh, but it's not completely diagnostic of it. So we'll need to uh, confirm it with other tests like biopsy and uh, assessment of the other systems as well so to come to a conclusive diagnosis. So all these tests are inconclusive. What would you do to confirm the diagnosis? I'm not sure, sir. Any role of biopsy, anything? Yes, uh, we do biopsies uh, uh, okay. to check for any granulomatous inflammation. So, uh, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vipi. Uh, so that is the end of today's uh, case presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank, uh, despite of the busy schedule, you guys made sure to be there for such a long time. Thank you so much. Um, any Uh, hello, uh, Niranjani ma'am. Yes. Um, uh, so, Lekhi, I just wanted to ask that uh, all the cases are presented or are we like 
So, um, who has been present, ma'am? I'll just tell you their names. Uh, I think Anthony and Panish, right? Yes, ma'am. One is, uh, yeah, Gopu Anthony and uh, another one is Tanish. Yes, ma'am. Both of them didn't. Oh, okay. Others all did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all the presentations are very good, Sulekha. And uh, the management as such, the way you people have managed all these things are good. Uh, students are very anxious and uh, anxious, not anxious actually. Um, very enthusiastic, I should say. Uh, at this level of uh, undergrads, such presentations are of rare cases are very good. And uh, you should always 100% go ahead and publish some of the rare cases like uh, Chinnes had also suggested that uh, the movie syndrome or the DBRC uh, specifically uh, to go ahead for a publication for the, those kind of uh, rare diseases. Yeah, it was a thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'm really sorry in between I had to go uh, because of some other no, 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 no. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much in my search. Um, thank you thank you all it was all all presenters were good so basically they all are very good candidates they are way ahead of me at that at their stage i did not know i had to do this if i had known this i i would have done at that stage at ug stage but the, these candidates are very good and yes one, so Reaction from my side also. <laughs> thank you, thank you so yeah, much. This, um, so, so we. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, all the results on the group. We'll do it on the group. So, thank you so much for being there today. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Everyone have a good day.